Let's spin the record and drop the needle on 1995, a year that had us logging into the brand new Windows 95 operating system to dial up and surf the web for tips on how to beat Chrono Trigger, before it was time to sit down for reruns of Legends of the Hidden Temple and a brand new Rocco's Modern Life. Somewhere in that mix, we found a film underappreciated in its time that emerged wrapped warmly in a flannel and denim mix of teenage dreams and rebellion. On the surface, we have a Save the Rec Center movie. But beyond that, a movie that has you relating to the pressures of being too young to make a decision on how you want your life to be after high school, and then later wondering about the what could have been of your youth. Despite being critically panned on release, this film we're going to talk about has continued to resonate with fans with its traditional David vs. Goliath story of a pending takeover by the big corporate overlords, but also captured that special mid-90s rite of passage into adulthood while we were all desperately seeking authenticity and still finding our own identities in the chaos of our youth. So it's your turn to pick a tune and get on the register, because every day is Rex Manning Day here at Screen Refresh, so let's talk about Empire Records. In a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. As always, I'm Tim, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, Nick, Dean, and David. Hello there. Damn the man. Save the Empire. I'm here, too. Hack the planet! (laughs) (laughs) Nick didn't let me introduce myself. (laughs) We're all ears. I said it. I mean, you can just move it to where you can hear it. I won't. (laughs) So, (laughs) So, Empire Records. Uh... This is my pick this month for all our dear listeners. I have desperately loved this movie for ages, and I don't know if you guys ever saw this prior to this. Uh, once. Ain't never seen it. Until yeah, I'm on the today. Nick train. I, I, this was definitely a once on cable, I think. Watching it again, knowing this was your pick, I absolutely see how this was a formative movie for you. I agree. And it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I'm not dragging the movie at all, but it's just there's some movies where it's a very formative, you know, movie for somebody as they're growing up. And seeing this one, I'm like, this is absolutely 1000% Tim. Is it because it was utterly 90s about a lot of whiny dreamers? No. Oh. I think it like fits. <laughs> I wouldn't have been offended. I think it's like, it feels like you could double feature this with hackers it has which is funny because hackers came out the same month as this i mean it really feels like they were made by a similar like mind or just like a collective um i mean that would that's my initial reaction to it i mean i i kept thinking the whole way through i'm like oh this is just 90s the breakfast club yeah didn't it have the same guy in the breakfast club too no that's not him that's not i was thinking about it earlier it almost looked like him it's more like it's if Judd Nelson was trying to dress like Scott Stapp, maybe. maybe. <laughs> it's also a I lot mean, of denim and a lot of flannel. So, Especially during the 90s, this, to me, rewatching it years later, felt kind of like how Clerks was a, like culturally important for its time of the slackerdom of this like almost angry, cynical view of taking part in like the commercialization of your youth. It's now I'm getting older, now I'm getting a job, all of this, but I still hate the day-to-day. This is still that, but this is instead of the like angry, cynical look at it, it's more of the still hopeful, but kind of bittersweet melancholy look at it of they haven't quite gotten to that next stage of life where now they're like, I'm in a rut, now I don't like where I am. It's, oh, what could be behind that curtain for me next? Sure. This movie came out September 22nd, 1995. It released against Seven, Showgirls, and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. Uh, so Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't bode well for any any movie to compete in that space. <laughs> yeah. Although actually, um Texas Chainsaw Next Generation, Renee Zellweger was in that as well, as well as Matthew McConaughey. So Renee Zellweger had a bang up weekend in uh, September 22nd, 1995, between this and Texas Chainsaw. She exploded shortly thereafter then, right? <laughs> yeah. Not literally. This, I mean, definitely not from either of these, because I know 
the movie itself just got panned by critics. It seemed like across the board, all critics hated it of like, it's meandering. It doesn't know what it wants to say. Like, it's just kind of whining about like not having your dreams done. And it's like, it's... also, I think sometimes we might need to have critics take a look at it of, yes, if I'm a 55 year old critic complaining about all these whiny kids not knowing what to do with their life, you're a few years removed from having your feet in those shoes exactly. So I don't know if it would have done better nowadays or if it would still be the same case now, but it's definitely got a cult following over time. How was the breakfast club in comparison? I, you know, I actually don't know. I think it's because John Hughes was a bigger name in general. So I think there was generally more fanfare about all of that. Whereas opposed to this, like there really wasn't anything Alan Moyle was like blowing out the doors to. I mean, he did pump up the volume with Christian Slater a few years before, which I still love that movie as well. At some point we might talk about that, but it was another like um, coming of age high school type movie. But other than that, not really anything that people would be like, hey, you know what? We're willing to overlook the faults because we know how great your other work is, like something like a John Hughes. It was cool to see all the actors being as young as they were because I recognized pretty much everybody in that cast. Yeah. I think the exception is like the dude that worked at the pizza place. He looked oh, insanely Eddie. familiar, but I couldn't place him anywhere that I would have known him. So through most of the scenes, I always called him like, you know, Jason Mews at home. <laughs> or uh not jason muse i don't think i've seen him in anything else yeah i think he was just yeah. in like geronimo and american legend um a couple years before that but that was like the only thing really sure i feel like when did days and confused come out was that after this before uh this yeah i say pretty I feel close, like maybe <laughs> a year before they told him like we've got rory cochran didn't he didn't he play in days and confused no yeah yeah he, he did, was and the I think slater Renee zellweger had a a part he was Slater, right? That's what his name. Uh, and Dazed yes. and Confused. I feel maybe I. It's been probably a decade <laughs> since I saw Dazed and Confused. I still haven't seen it. Oh, it's great! It was like early middle of Joe. Uh, right, she's Jovovich? in that too. Is that how you say that? Jovovich. 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 They told the pizza guy to say, "Look at Rory Cochran's role in Dazed and Confused, and just do a spin on that." Maybe they told Ethan Embry that too. <laughs> Take a piece. Maybe they told of all of them to do that, <laughs> <laughs> except for Rory Cochran. <laughs> Listen, you all saw Dazed and Confused, right? Okay, now just do that, except you <laughs> be different. Um, so yeah, this uh, back in September 22nd, 1995, the rest of September was to Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar, Hackers, as we mentioned, Devil in a Blue Dress, Angus, and Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers with a very young Paul Rudd. Interesting, like, I know we always go back to it, but like, one month in 1995, and even if you love or hate some of these movies, it's just like, yep, it's nine to ten recognizable movies that we still know of and has fans today. As a kid, I remember seeing the trailer for Angus and immediately I was just like, I don't want to see this fucking movie. I don't even know why I have such a deep, like, seated hatred for that movie. I just constantly remember seeing it on the commercials and it was like trying to advertise itself to me. Like, I don't care. I don't want it. Yeah, it's I still haven't seen it like you said, but I remember seeing all the commercials and it was just like, even as a kid, I, I still don't really know what this is about. Like, I guess it's a kid Angus. I guess it's a coming of age thing, but I don't know if it's really for me. Maybe I was too young. And then by the time I was old enough, I just didn't care. I don't know that one. Yeah. I, I must've missed those ads. I don't I'm not familiar with Angus at all. Huh? It might be um, buried in there. I think if you see one of the TV spots for it, you probably all. Uh, maybe. Probably... I think they played it a lot on like the commercials popped up on like MTV. Oh, I think okay. that was during like it, back during that time. I feel like a lot of the things targeted at the rebellious youth culture was just, oh, we just put all of it and air it on MTV. That's where all of our ads are going to go. I mean, Empire Records would make sense just because this entire thing is like a jukebox movie of it's just like song after song after song. The, the budget was $10 million. The box office was just over 300000 it had a limited release but still that i guess like between critics and between everything else everybody was just kind of like eh on the whole movie and not until years later now it's become like oh it's the fans will end up having all of these yearly watch things april 8th they usually end up doing rex manning day where they'll do like airings of this and cast and crew will come out for it which 
Rex Manning Day in the movie is never actually mentioned as April 8th. I guess they ended up landing on it because it's not the day that Kurt Cobain died. It was the day that Kurt Cobain was found. So it ends up becoming this like the day of like a 90s rock icon or like a 90s music icon, how he lost them. So they use this as the placeholder day for Empire Records. Hmm, It's kind of cool how that's kind of expanded out. Like, despite the fact that this movie did not have a huge theatrical success, that, like, its cult following was enough still to have, like, a a larger cultural impact like that. Some movies, it's sad that they were just made a little too soon. If it was made during the era of the internet, I really feel this movie would have exploded. Mm. Even if the internet was a fraction of what it is now, back then, like, if this came out in, like, later... 90s or like mid 2000s i think it would have done a much because it i feel all the people it was meant to be shown to just wasn't aware it was happening it wasn't even like they were too old or um too old that they wouldn't care or too young that they wouldn't know about it it's just i feel the marketing behind it just did not hit its target audience until it was too late yeah and i feel like this movie is so hyper focused on a specific audience that like tim you were saying how like critics completely panned it this movie is for a very specific target demographic and i think only speaks to that target demographic and like if you're outside that it's kind of like what is this (laughs) which i think the thing that i appreciate now is growing up i watch this and i relate to the characters themselves of like feeling anxious about yeah i'm supposed to decide the rest of my life and i'm like 17 years old and then rewatching it later, it's like, yeah, I still relate to certain things from there. But then relating to like Joe and Jane of we're already past the point of deciding my life. And now it's like the I used to be cooler or like I used to have a dream that I feel like now it's what happens to a dream deferred kind of stuff. It You can watch it from two different points and still appreciate it just differently from there, which like you said, Nick, as far as if this was made later, well, for, if, if it was made later, I don't know, they wouldn't be able to have a record store. But like if they ended up making it later, I don't know if it would end up still doing well even then, because I feel like this is a movie that needed to happen in the 90s and then not be popular for a few years until we were after the year 2000 and can start looking back at it with some nostalgia, just the time period itself. Because I feel like this is a movie that just like, really ends up taking advantage of me feeling nostalgic for a time period Mm. almost like a time period piece it's like a period piece but like a 90s period piece which is not something like i mean i guess we do have in like that kind of 93 to 95 era but i think not quite so iconic because this takes place in basically like a a single uh location (laughs) which is the which is the record story which makes it like so iconic both in location and what that location means and is the biggest takeaway i had while watching this was it made me miss working at blockbuster so much Mm. you know i'm not that big into music but at least seeing all of the same symbolism that i experienced working at blockbuster a lot of it was there and even though it was more along the lines of what was it called like music city that's what blockbuster would have been instead of just you know your local friendly rental place it definitely had vibes similar to that, whereas just that love of what you're doing and the whole retail hell didn't set in on that specific job. Yeah. I mean, the entire time watching this, it just made me feel nostalgic for like working at like a blockbuster, which even though we were we were the corporate takeover, as you said, like we weren't necessarily the mom and pop shop, but just yeah. the idea of banding together with other people who were like this isn't my career this is just my job until i go achieve the things that i want to do and just all of the the very like pop culture influence around that role itself whether that's the record store the cd store or like a movie store um, but all of that generally yeah i mean there's that piece of it that like you're not just you know working retail in that period of your life but it's that you're working retail but it's a retail store of something that you love and in that period of your life yeah i mean i've worked at retail jobs where they it's it's sucking the very essence of life from me blockbuster i felt never had that kind of affliction and i actually enjoyed and looked forward to going into a retail store to do what we were tasked to do every day because we get to watch movies. We get to talk about movies and just being around movies is such an awesome thing. 
Whereas all the other stores where I've had to work at for general retail or it soul sucking, you know, it's the worst of the worst when it comes to uh, when it comes to customer service. Blockbuster, whole different story. But I, I can imagine, too, the same thing with like working at a music store. It's the same exact medium, but just instead of a two hour movie, it's just different records because it has emotional impact. It has just creative impact. And what it does to people is just a whole different thing. Yeah, I mean, it's the the difference between jobs that we get just because it's like, hey, I need a job. Like, I'm I'm old enough now that I need to be able to, like, pay for my movies or, like, pay for gas in my car. So I'm going to go work retail versus the ones of being young and going to something like a Blockbuster, going to these types of, like, passion stores. And it's like, hey, I really want to work here. How old do I need to be before I can start working here and being involved in this? Um, Because I I doubt that anybody's like chomping at the bit like, man, when my 16th birthday rolls around that Walmart, I'm going to go into a fucking with a gun and I'm going to get a job at my local Walmart. (laughs) I was wondering where that was going. I was getting a little nervous. (laughs) Uh, For anybody who hasn't seen Empire Records, don't worry, we'll get to this later. So speaking of all of this then, so yeah, we mentioned Alan Moyle, the director. He did uh, pump up the volume, things like Times Square, a lot of films that were very related to the cultural teenage zeitgeist of the time. And the writer, uh, Carol Heikinen, who also did Thing Called Love and Center Stage, I believe Carol Heikinen is going to be involved. There was, for the longest time, I guess, a broadway production or like some sort of musical that was being based around empire records they were trying to get off the ground it ended up hitting a halt during covid but i think they're still trying to work on that so she'll be involved in that process for writing the book for all of that but before the movie like you mentioned before nick like this cast overall like everybody from anthony lapalia debbie mazar maxwell caulfield rory cochran johnny whitworth robin tunnies Brene zellberger ethan Embry. Everybody in this has been in generally they did so much stuff, um, even if you're not necessarily familiar with them. Some of them went on to do bigger things later. Some of them either were already big or did like indie things later on. Like Maxwell Caulfield had already done like Grease 2 by this point. He was on things like the Colbys. I know like even though everybody else ended up getting bigger movies, Liv Tyler, Lord of the Rings, all of this. Um, but others like Brandon Sexton the Third, he was Warren in this. He ended up doing stuff like Session 9, um, a horror movie from years later. So everybody's been in something. And it's just interesting being able to see all of them when they're still like borderline babies at this point. I found out Rex Manning did a lot of voiceover work in like Spider-Man. Really? That I didn't know. Yeah. I fr- he wasn't any of the major roles. He did a lot of like supporting characters or like the smaller villains but he still had a presence in it so before we kick off this intro does anybody have any other pre-game thoughts on empire records i have one that's a little sullen so unless somebody has something else so i was just gonna say watching this movie i could not get over the fact that boy this is a thirsty movie like <laughs> holy crap <laughs> i will take things i was not expecting from renee zellweger for 200 dollars, alex it makes sense like they're all like teenagers and working in a record store and you know we all remember that time in our lives i think but like boy this is a thirsty movie (laughs) i mean i think the thing that amazes me more that we'll get into is how many points throughout this that it's just like does everybody remember that there's still customers in the store this place is open right Like people taking their shirts off, like in the middle of the aisle or like Mark walking around and dusting things and then just like tries to sneak a kiss from a girl. And it's like, you're being creepy now. (laughs) Oh, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, there is that one moment where like everyone is, I mean, we'll get to it, like having the eulogy and Mark is just at the front counter by himself with a crowd of customers and he just gets on the intercom and he's just like, help, help me. (laughs) Help me. Oh, (laughs) God. I just want to (laughs) Jake. Joe, Joe is, Joe is an S tier boss and a shit yes. tier manager. <laughs> yes, mm. that's that's all I have to say about. Well, Joe. that's why it's tough being a manager and a father figure. <laughs> yeah. After the gun incident, I was always concerned. Like, where the entire staff is in the back room? Who's on the floor? And you could see the floor from like certain camera angles. It's busy. Who the hell's out there? And it's like you take the time to stop one shoplifter. You got like 15 out out there right now. 
Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, that, I think uh, the whole concept of Joe being like, this is my record store for wayward youth is like, <laughs> I, I, I get it. It's almost like he's running it more of an after school program than a business. It's more to keep them <laughs> off the streets than keep the doors open to this place. <laughs> hey, if we don't help, AJ will be doing art just out on the street corners. <laughs> so, yes, what's your sullen thing, Nick? So if you or anybody is having trouble, there's always somebody that you can possibly talk to. You can always call 988 at the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Um, they are available 24 hours a day, and they speak, you know, obviously English, Spanish. There's a lot of heavy tones to this movie, despite how lighthearted it is in many other spots. And I did want to throw that trigger warning at least out there because there are several suicidal scenes, or at least it mentions and talks about it. And especially because when I had to Google two things, now I feel like I'm put on a list because when I looked it up, it immediately gave me this information and then followed through with the rest of it. So I was like, oh, OK. So I figured I might as well include that. No, it's a very good. point. Yeah, it, it is a plot point throughout this film, specifically for one character. We even have a, a living wake for one of them because of all of this. Yeah. I googled what speed was, and that was the second time because I, I knew what speed was, but I wanted like the Google answer. Yeah, and it brought up this thing. I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ! I'm and it gives of- you that number <laughs> followed by like, are you watching Empire Records? <laughs> right. It, wait, so it's it's when you're on a bus and it can't go below sixty, right? <laughs> <laughs> we know you're on speed, Corey. We know you're on speed two cruise control. But uh, speed is speed is meth. I did not know that. Amphetamine. I oh. d- I didn't I, know that. I did is not it meth amphetamine, like amphetamine or is it just an amphetamine? It's a it's a it's a it's a methamphetamine. Yeah. Huh. Huh. I did dun, not know dun, that. Dun, dun, dun. Um, it's not like blue crystal from Breaking Bad. It's just a different form of it. And I was I was literally about to Google it. I'm like, nah, I'm not going to be on the same list as Nick because then they'll yeah, they'll no. compile that and then they're starting to get a case. Well, I find the website says what's <laughs> like the difference Rico. between amphetamine and methamphetamine. So I, I don't know, but do your own research. <laughs> <laughs> or don't, because who really needs to know and that then, information? And then send not, it all to Dean. For not experiment. Next don't experiment. <laughs> just read about it. When the cinematographer jobs aren't coming through, <laughs> Dean has to move to his backup job. <laughs> Join Dean's Patreon. <laughs> so yes. So anyway, uh, like I, we've already gone over, but I just want to begin the intro to this movie by saying, like, I am deeply, deeply nostalgic for the '90s, and this movie always continues just from the get-go to make me feel like happy just even before it starts. Um, as we get the music kick in, and then we have Lucas, Roy Cochran explaining to Gina that walks in of like, oh, like, why are you still here? And he explains, Joe's letting me close the store tonight. You're kidding. I am not. Big responsibility, Lucas. Yes, but Joe's rules are extremely simple. Count money twice, keep my hands off of his beer, cigars, and drumsticks. My, my, how will you remember it all? Which understanding movies we all know that we will probably immediately hit a smash cut that goes directly to him doing all of these things why are you all sweaty <laughs> i was watching cops <laughs> so this actually brings to a good point there are two versions to this movie there's the theatrical cut and then there's the fan edition um which also may be known as the extended fox version depending on at one point the dvd only had that extended version But if you catch it on some of the streaming services or depending on if you buy the digital version, you may have one or the other. So do you guys know which one you watched? Was it the 90 minute one or the um, like hour 47? It's whatever was on Hulu. Uh, Yep, I watched the Hulu one. I was say I watched the fan one because it was also specifically titled the fan edition. (laughs) Okay. So yeah, so if you guys watched the version that was not the longer one, the theatrical cut, then you probably ended up having it of him doing this and then kind of like jumping directly to him um, doing all of these things, which in the longer version, we end up having Lucas closing the store out. And then there's a girl that knocks on the door and she really wants to get in. And she talks about how um, all of these very cryptic things that ultimately convince Lucas to go and smoke a cigar and drink some beer and play drums on Joe's drum set. And that's where he ends up finding out all of the plans that the Empire Records store is going to end up being bought out and turned into a music town. 
And then he decides that I'm going to take all the money that needs to go into this deposit. I'm going to take it to Atlantic City. I'm going to bet it all. And we're going to win the money to be able to save this store, uh, which is very different depending on if we ended up kind of going through the the shortened version. So yeah, so Lucas decides he's going to take the $9,000, he's going to go to Atlantic City, and he's going to gamble it and win the money back to save the store, uh, which I like how somebody ends up kind of wishing him luck on this, and he's like, I'm guided by a force much greater than luck, and he is hot for a minute. He is winning every he's, game of craps. No, he's not in, once. He won a hundred percent of the games he played <laughs> up until the point where he lost. I was gonna uh, say I saw, which I saw was this one, and I was like, and then he lost like, two. What are the rules to craps? Because like, if it's just roll a seven, I mean, statistically, you're most likely to roll a seven. Like, craps is one of those games where when I'm in the casino, I'm like, they're having a good time. I have no idea how it works, but somebody's doing very well. No, thanks. It was tough watching this as an adult because Lucas makes extremely irresponsible decision and he greatly impacts the lives and business to the point of foreclosure. Like at the point, I didn't know that, that like the whole grand scheme of how everything is going to happen afterward. But just losing that much money is absolutely insane to just go to Atlantic City and through the whole course of the movie, Joe is insanely calm considering that he basically had that money stolen and his his final plan is like I, I expected a murder. I I really did. Well, plus like I know I always liked a lot of Lucas's lines and things like that throughout this movie, and I generally like Lucas. But also, it's like he is unrepentant about all of it to the point where he antagonizes Joe repeatedly <laughs> about Joe being like, "You stole nine thousand dollars and you lost it," and he's just like. Joe, you seem a little angry, Joe. And it's like, <laughs> yes, you stole all the money the store made that needed to get deposited and you just blew it somewhere. So like, yeah, Lucas ends up becoming a little bit on this rewatch. He he is a little bit of a heel throughout this entire movie on just how poorly he treats Joe. Yeah, his, his character is interesting, right? Because his horrible, rash decision is what sets the whole th everything in motion right is is the the crux of of the 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 drama that they have to get over in the movie and yet after after that initial scene lucas plays or is like given the role of being the wise teenager that like everyone comes to like he is the one like giving out advice or like being like extremely stoic and yet he is the one who is the problem like it's so funny because Lucas is so calm, he's so put together, and yet you have like his opposite, which is Mark, who's like manic and ridiculously high based on the amount of pot brownies he <laughs> ate. And yet Lucas is portrayed as the calm, collected, put together one, and Mark is the most disheveled, despite the fact that Mark has done nothing wrong and is and is most of the time honestly working. Well, I mean, except when he, he tried to kiss that girl who had her eyes closed. Um <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, there's mm, <laughs> there's some stuff in this. Um, <laughs> it's not even a case of like it aged poorly. No, it wasn't good then. Mark was still creepy when he tried to do that. Unless like it's supposed to be. I know. So here, I know for any, a lot of people watching this movie, it is a movie that doesn't give you a lot of like background. It doesn't give you a lot of preamble. It's just kind of like dropping you into a slice of life of we are spending like. 24 hours like one shift at this store with all these kids and you're just piecing together the backgrounds and like their relationships and their histories and all of them during this time which i love like i love the idea of not having them be like introducing all of them to each other or having aj be like well Corey, as you know like back when we used to meet when we were kid like it ignores all of that so i don't know if it's a case of like does Mark know this girl somehow? Is it just supposed to be like, is she a regular and they know each other? Or is it just Mark walking up to some girl who's not paying attention and just tries to kiss her, which is don't do that. I've been out of retail for a while, but like, don't do that. Well, don't so kiss the customers. She, she's fucking, she's wearing, she's barefoot in a, in a music store trying to do pirouettes while listening to music. I mean, the whole, the whole she scene deserves to be kissed. is, is weird, you know? But I do, I do like how it doesn't give you any exposition to anything. It's just we're literally dropping you in on this specific day, on the day of 
Rex Manning and that's it. We're not doing anything else. We're not giving you any backstory. Just sit in the corner, watch as everything goes on, and you'll figure it out as we go. I appreciate that, and more movies need to do that. Yeah, yeah. and you don't really it, – it, it wouldn't improve the movie at all because, like, you very quickly pick up – because you have, like, teenager types in this, right? Like, you have, like, some mildly stereotyped, like – here is the really smart person who's like getting by because she does drugs. The person from the broken home, like the person who is dealing with depression and suicide, like the pothead, like, and you get that very quickly and very easily, both in just like how they act with each other and also like certain actions that they take in the store. Um, and I don't think like having like a 30 minute introduction where you see them at home before they go to work would prove that like that would be, I would assume like a more modern movie if they did this would do like that intro exposition where it's like oh bye mom and dad blah, 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 and you yeah. see their home life a little bit but like and this is just like no it doesn't it doesn't matter it's like this is this is their personality here you go i mean if this was like 2002 2003 they would do a freeze frame and then it would just hear the typing noise and it would just be like on the screen text of name and like likes dislikes and all of that kind of stuff it's like an episode of point meets world yeah <laughs> <laughs> when it's boy meets world i forget a lot of the characters names the suicider girl deb. deb when she shaves her head one of the, the other cool suave guy burko rex man sure yeah no <laughs> um he comes up to him and he's like you shaved your head and it's like you know you were okay last night no context yeah are they a thing are they together or did they you know is anything going on with them no idea and it, you still don't know by the end of the movie they don't act like they're dating, but who knows? Her personality was very quirky at the same time, so it was kind of tough to tell. Oh, I figured they were dating based on their interaction. Yeah, and I mean, at, at one point she does end up when he, Burko comes over to talk to her about like what's wrong, and she explains like it's how I feel last night, or like then it's not even that. It's how I felt last month. It's how I felt last year. And it's like, okay, so have they been on and off for a while? Or is this like, she's just talking about her life and they happen to be together last night? Um, which is why I kind of like that of, don't you don't have to tell me everything because if I spend one day with a person, I'm not going to learn about all of their life. I'm just going to learn about bits and pieces of whatever was happening that day and whatever might have been relevant from like, recent experiences so lucas prepares to escape on his motorcycle after losing all the money he was supposed to deposit like i said i i don't mind all the corny wacky lines that lucas spouts in this film i find it endearing even though i do find that he needed to treat joe better because joe seemed to be a <laughs> a pretty good father figure other than the time he drags lucas into his office and just beats the shit out of him but like other than that yes he deserved it he absolutely deserved it <laughs> It was so unexpected though because it, it wasn't like it wasn't like joe's knee-jerk reaction right it wasn't like joe finds out and then beats him up it was joe finds out waits like four hours and then he, like his anger comes back and he's like oh that's right i'm mad i'm gonna beat you up now <laughs> It was like he thought about beating him up for at least an hour. It was kind of and then it was like, all right, I'm going to do it now. It seemed uncharacteristic of what they've shown us of Joe. Yeah, to I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that though. seem like they are a little bit out of place for characters and things. But yeah, I mean, even directly after that, he then ends up saying like, "You deserve that, you know it, right?" I know it. So either that's creating a really weird family situation for lucas of like you brought this upon yourself lucas you understand this right <laughs> but, but also like your boss just beat you up like there, there's a which lot is of worse because it's your boss slash dad <laughs> yeah boss dad oh boss. yeah i mean so that was unless i miss something i know he's hits upon it towards the end of the movie but like that was something i wasn't totally understanding well, he yeah, he mentions it towards the, the so towards the end of the film, um, when they're kind of confiding in a lot of things. Lucas even mentions he said like, "I was a chronic bedwetter growing up, and then when I was ten, my mother turned me over to county." It's not for being a, a bedwetter, but for being a bad seat, you know. Anyways, three years went by, and uh, and Joe came, and he uh, took me out, and I became well-adjusted person that i am today and like he's talking about appreciating joe I mean, he didn't even say joe took importance. me in he just said joe found me and then he left it at that oh, yeah, and i was joe still like i need a little more 
<laughs> it's like he hired me at 13. It was illegal, but I showed up with a boot knife and Joe just said, fine, here's a name tag. That just, that piece of information, I'm, I get like withholding information till certain parts the way you want to tell your story, but I'm like, I think that would have been nice. I would have nice to know, understand that earlier on in the story. I mean, I feel like it, it kind of felt like that situation of Joe was clearly a father figure or like at least some sort of role model to Lucas that then when he ends up revealing it, which I like how it wasn't just kind of he drops that to like talking to Joe and telling Joe. And it's like, no, Joe would already know at this point, but he's revealing it to the rest of the people in the room that it feels a little bit more organic than him just being like, well, Joe, as you know, when I was 10 and it's like, yeah, Joe knows he was the one who found you. I, I understand. Yeah, that's a pet peeve of mine for terrible ham explanations. But um, when Lucas just should have worked that in at the, the front of the store one night in the rain, he's like splinter. <laughs> uh so yeah so joe arrives annoyed that it's rex manning day already as they prepare for his arrival rex manning is this kind of slightly out of touch pop star who seems like at one point he was very popular and he still has stuff that's popular with kind of a an older subset but he's clearly kind of past his heyday but he's going to be coming to do a meet and greet and signing at the store to kind of boost sales for them uh, which I would have loved a record store like this back during the 90s heyday. Like we had stuff like Strawberries or FYE or things like that. But it was never you walk in and it's just aisles of records and it's like a two floor like vaulted ceiling. And it's just people choosing the music to play. It was always very corporate of we got the music town growing up. We didn't get the Empire. Um, so it was a lot of the here's the record with the number of songs that you are allowed to play and you will have the same 10 songs that will play because those are the records we need to sell this week direct from europe this multi-platinum collection has won the hearts of millions so i don't know if you guys were you like record or cd people growing up no well, like no, either or CDs or which thing. one or i no, I either or or i mean or cassette no i mean cassettes the cassettes i had were like the lion king soundtrack it wasn't really anything like noteworthy. And then once I was of age to listen to CDs, I mean, sure. My first cassette was the fucking Macarena. <laughs> My first cassette was Out of Their Shells. That's awesome. See, that's, yes. That's cool. The, the turtle, Mine was the turtles, Macarena. The Turtles um, Broadway thing, right? Yeah, it was like the live show. Yeah, I had with, like too. April's Ballad and all. Yeah. I, I think um, I had like the, the Alvin and the Chipmunks. Yeah, my first cassette was Spice Girls. Um, spice up your life, David. Spice up my life. Uh, but yeah, I didn't get I didn't get into music till high school because my like neither one of my parents really listened to music, so like I didn't really get introduced to it until like you high grew up in the town of Footloose. I did. It was a very Footloose town. Well, <laughs> I mean, I guess to be fair, I, I should say my parents didn't really listen to music except exclusively the Gypsy Kings, um, <laughs> which was the only thing I ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not bad. I mean, it's not bad. It's just, you know. Just interesting to be like, we don't really listen to music except. <laughs> except this one Latin band from Puerto Rico. <laughs> Which I guess ultimately makes sense. I mean, it does make a lot of sense. They're an interesting band, actually. They, they're, it's a Puerto Rican, uh, uh, I'm not even sure what to call their genre. Uh, but they're a Puerto Rican band, but they didn't get together until they met in the south of France. Huh. Yeah, it was Small very strange. World. I know, right? As it's like do. these four, four Puerto Rican or four or five Puerto Rican guys, and it's like eventually moved to southern France, and then they're in France, and they're like, hey, we should start a band together and, ba- and make Latin music. <laughs> it's like, all right, that's kind of obscure, but cool. We'll take France by storm. I mean, they're pretty well regarded if you know Latin music of the yeah. time, but you know, I don't, I don't, I don't recall their name, but I'm pretty sure if you played their music, I probably would recognize it. I was like, do you know Bumbleano? <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, because yeah. um, I know my grandmother listened to that constantly and all that kind of like genre of music. So mm. I don't know any of the names of the songs, any of the artists themselves, but yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, history with that with me. I guess back to your to your question, Tim. Well, kind of hitting upon it, like I had cassette cassettes, I guess, but then I mean CDs were pretty soon after. Um, music was huge. Like I still, of course, love music, but. I definitely fell out of like seeking out music and 
being excited for new new music. Now I just kind of catch whatever is popular or whatever somebody else recommends to me. But at the time, I would definitely be excited to be going to Hot Topic or FYE and stores like that. The record store, Empire Records, kind of reminds me of... The only place I think I've been to that's like it is sadly no longer open, which was Amoeba Records out here in uh, Los Angeles. Oh, is Amoeba um, no longer around? No, it's closed down. Oh. It's gone. Sad Because I remember, they, did they used to do the, the YouTube series of What's in Your Bag? Sure. Where there'd be all different artists, and it would just be like, it would be it's similar to like the Criterion Closet. It would just be talking to them about what are the five records that you're buying today, and then just asking them about why this record, what's this artist's oh, importance to you. Oh, wait, did they, maybe they just moved. <laughs> maybe they just moved. Sorry. <laughs> um, don't listen it's like to two me. streets over to a bigger a bigger spot and dean's like oh they're gone regularly goes and just like salts the earth cries oh, wait. to the heavens Am I meanwhile they're just Amiga behind him shit there's something else that closed down that was legendary sorry don't Sun listen Coast. to me i think i'm just turned around uh yes they were they're no longer with us oh i'm sorry they passed no they moved out of state <laughs> oh. <laughs> we're right over here dean we're behind you you know i never look back there so yes so AJ tries to prep himself to act surprised when Joe finds out the money is missing after he gets a phone call from the bank because AJ and Mark run into Lucas and find out that uh, something went wrong last night, which I like how Mark is the crazy chaos one. And even he like hears about it. And he's just like, oh, oh, no. <laughs> it's like if Mark isn't going to take nine thousand dollars and go gamble it away, then uh, maybe Lucas is the crazier one here. I know he's so calm about it. And it, it, it just it just baffles me that like he knows the severity of what he's done and is just like, yeah, but it'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> well, I thought he was like gonna skip town and he gets on his motorcycle and takes off, and then he just pops back up at the store like an hour later, and it's where is it? like people are just drifting in and out of the store throughout the entire day. We'll get into it later that at one point, like Corey and Gina are just at the pizza place having lunch sitting outside that I'm wondering like wait a second we literally just went from a scene of you working at the store to then smash cut to you sitting at a, the pizza place outside somewhere else having a conversation then it cuts back and like one of you is back at the store working so there's a lot of geographic weirdness and yeah that's a that's a good point with the the pizza place thing because I was watching it and like they do the pizza place cut and I was like I was suddenly very confused I'm like did they bring pizza to the store I, I, I don't know. It was such like a it was such a harsh cut that I was just like, "What?" <laughs> they were there all day, and then they get a lunch break. So since none of them really smoke, they probably just bundled all their breaks into one. And like, all right, I'm gonna take my hour lunch, and that's it. Or just they leave and come back. Or he's just that chill of a boss that is just like, I don't care as long as you're back here to close or do your main goal of the day. <laughs> Collectively kill Lucas. And don't go to the police when I beat you up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I also looked it up. $9,000 in 1995 is worth $18,326 oh. today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what he wanted in Vegas was uh, $36,000. Yeah. lost. I mean, it. Even even in ninety five nine thousand dollars, that's still a lot of money today. If you told me I need nine thousand dollars from you, that's still going to make me sweat trying yeah. to figure out how to get that to you. Let alone eighteen thousand. Eighteen thousand is just like that that gif of you know Jay Joe and Jameson just laughing in the guy's face. Like that's the, no, you're not getting that much. I'm 9, pretty sure is liver is like thirty two thousand dollars these days. Hmm? Unrelated. What anyway? No, I didn't hear you. <laughs> oh, I said I'm pretty sure a liver is thirty two thousand dollars these days. No. <laughs> uh i, I don't know I do from want to go back to very slightly like lucas puts the money in the craps table rolls the dice wins doubles his money and then he's like no this isn't enough it's like lucas i know for a fact you didn't do the math to figure out how much money you would need to save the store like double is he probably didn't deduce fine. that from a picture that just folds over another picture <laughs> it's like dude double is probably fine <laughs> That's insane that nightly revenue is $9,000. That's a that's, lot of money for I, one day. That's why I wonder. I don't At a know, record store. I feel like that. I don't know if that deposit was all of the stores. I, I don't know. that. that uh, I don't know exactly, Tim, or if you know exactly what all that money was. Because that's well, right. It sounded like, like it was you the You don't daily make that deposit. kind of money in, in one day. At least I not mean, a, unless a record it's, they store, don't right? do a daily deposit. 
Yeah, maybe it's a weekly thing. And it was just like, oh, we do it every so often. It's just been in the safe. Because, yeah, like I agree, like $9,000 seems like a lot in 1995 for just selling CDs all day. What were, what were they like? So, 15, that's even worse. Bucks? You mean to tell me the, the kids stole multiple days worth, worth of, yeah. Yeah, like almost a week's worth of sales. <laughs> I, I, I'm i surprised that Joe didn't just steal the kid's gun and shoot Lucas right then and there. <laughs> it's good he didn't well, tell anybody that he, he did double the money and then lose it because I think that would have been it worse. Be so much worse. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the only thing is it's not like even if he doubled it and even if he doubled it again, I feel like that's not what would have been like, that's what we need. We saved it from being Music Town. I highly doubt like the sellout of the store to become Music Town is probably going to be more money than the equivalent of at most two weeks of what you make at this store. I mean, even if what happens, you bring in that money and then you tell Mitch, yeah, this is what we sold. And they're like, wow, you guys did great. We'll stay open another month. And then like the sales come back bad or whatever he doesn't like. And then you're back to square one. So I'm not sure well, exactly no, what they were going to do is they were going to hire Warren to show up at Mitch's <laughs> house. But this time they were going to use the $36,000 to buy bullets for Warren's gun. <laughs> Hollow points. So. <laughs> I want to know where the kid got blanks from. I mean, I can understand people stealing weapons from certified gun owners, but to get blanks on top of that? Yeah, I can see if it was this? like, well, it was unloaded, but it's like, wait, no. So that means he had blanks, filled it with blanks, and that's what he... We'll get into that, but like, yeah. good God, Warren. <laughs> so... Uh, we end up first getting introduced to Gina and Corey, uh, Renee Zellweger and Liv Tyler, when Gina picks up Corey, who had time to make cupcakes while studying, while preparing for today, which her line I actually use sometimes as a joke and people just assume I'm like really determined of the... When did you have time to make these? That says there's 24 usable hours in every day. Thank you. I know people talk about certain things in this movie of, well, they just kind of... It pops up and they never gave any foreshadowing or like they never let on to anything and it just seems random. When we get into later the idea of her using stimulants and things to stay awake or like to enhance her ability to study, like even from the get-go right here, they kind of already make mention of there might be something going on of how did you find time? Like you're making cupcakes and you studied for your thing and you're doing other stuff last night. Like how'd you do it? There's 24 usable hours every day. Like it's perfectly fine. So I feel like there is some backing to all of the stuff that does come up later even if it does feel a little bit like a very special episode on the back half of this film mm, she's got a time turner <laughs> <laughs> but she's only allowed to use it in empire records one not in two not in three wait so was was the time turner just a uh analogy for methamphetamines <laughs> <laughs> Hermione was just on speed. Hermione's like, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so scared. <laughs> Which also, hopefully, all of our listeners from the 90s will remember that one. Um, so, yeah. So, Corey ends up letting Gina know she's planning to offer herself to Rex Manning, that this is going to be the day. Um, and then we get back to the shop where AJ ends up asking Joe for advice and telling Corey how he feels because he decides, like, it's been long enough where she's getting ready to hear about her college entrance and I'm figuring out my life like now is the time I need to tell her about this which I love how everybody treats Joe as a father figure throughout this film because like he genuinely cares for the kids even though they drive him crazy of trying to be a person and a like an adult to them while also trying to have to be their boss because I think like at some point in our lives we all had some sort of job where either it was a case of like we had some sort of relationship to a boss or a manager or we were the manager that then kind of felt responsible for the younger generation behind us of like hey i've been where you are i get it like i treat you as a person first and an employee second kind of deal unless only me no i think that's <laughs> I, I mean i don't know i mean i i'm i'm Everybody's hoping that replaceable i was gonna say i'm hoping that's uh, like the best way to be a manager Mainly because that's my style, but <laughs> nope. Everybody's so, replaceable. I'm going to tell you what to do every waking second and micromanage you until uh, you quit. Because I'm just going to find somebody else. Also, for anybody listening, Nick is hiring. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. 
<laughs> I've always wanted to be the cool manager. Like, you know, I've gotten like years. It's just like bosses are always so preoccupied about this, that and the other. That really does not pertain to anything when it comes to your day to day job. Like, I don't fucking care, man. As long as you're doing your job and I don't got to hear that you're not doing it. Do what you need to do to like keep on going. And I really respect how cool Joe is so often throughout the entire thing where he really doesn't care. And they're still raking in money. Everybody's happy for the most part. Yeah. And it's it works. He's discovered a system. It's not broken. I'm gonna think that they made nine thousand dollars the night before. You know, that's that's really good money. Mitch has got a two. I was, um, gonna, I was gonna say, I mean, I agree. Devil's advocate, Lucas did steal nine thousand dollars from the store. So maybe there there is a fault in that management style. Although I do appreciate most of what he does. Well, also don't adopt your workers. <laughs> <laughs> Although we never know. Did he steal the money or did he try to, he just mismanaged the money? Is that, maybe that's <laughs> the gross mismanagement. <laughs> because he, in, theft, he intended to grow the money for the store. He just, it was very. Uh, I'm trying to remember how mis- he phrased it when, when Joe asked him where the money was. He was like, it, no, it's, yeah, yeah, it's like the money, it's, it's, it's recirculating probably in, a different in Atlantic City. city. <laughs> yeah. What is it doing in Atlantic City, Lucas? Recirculating. Are you pissed off, Joe? Is it leaving Atlantic City? <laughs> but yeah, like I I I think Joe definitely does have to manage his that balance a little bit more, but I I think everybody, if you're a manager out there right now, dear listeners, or if you're an employee, you need to be a better manager in treating people like people. I know like we've definitely I've worked jobs over the years that's been a case of like workers being told like you're if you're leaving for another job, you're blacklisted around here. Like you're not welcome back kind of deal. And I would have to tell staff, like they're finally coming to us and they're like admitting like, Hey, like, I'm so sorry, but I, I'm going to go for another job. Like it's going to pay me more. Like it's going to be closer to what I want to do in life. And it's like, yeah, you like, don't apologize to me. Well, it's a job. We'll figure stuff out from here. But like, if you went to school for music and you're stuck working a desk job and all of a sudden you get an offer somewhere to like, go do a dream, like, go do it we should probably figure out like people first and then figure out the bottom line on all of our staffing afterwards staff proactively not reactively especially retail they always make it seem like it's you know the god's given gift to work upon the site known as walmart or like those kinds of stores like you're just a retail store man like this isn't my hopes and dreams and then they get offended when you say you're really old. Well, you don't say to them you're only in it for the money. But it's like, why would you want to work for Target? Like, well, I like electricity and being able to eat. I mean, that's the most basis. that's the most ridiculous thing about like a retail job is is the idea that there isn't there that there is even an interview. Like, yeah. you know why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, at like at best, it's a symbiotic relationship of like, well, why do you want to work here? Well, I don't want to die of starvation, so. I will give you eight hours of my life at a time and you will give me enough money to not die between it, my wow. time to come back for another eight hours. In theory, they give you enough money so that you don't die. <laughs> Cost of living adjustments, all of that. Yes, it's it's a tough time, listeners out there. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so he needs to really rethink kind of some of this balancing here. But they pull M&Ms to determine who picks the song to play next while they open and Mark wins. And uh, plays an absolute bop, which somehow bothers AJ a lot that he ends up not only vetoing and pulling the CD out, but then he burns it with a lighter just to prevent him (laughs) from ever playing it again. And this is like the start of the first of like a thousand music montage dance sequences throughout this movie, which I don't know if you watch the shortened version, if some of these were cut or what the case was with that. I watched the Footloose version, but not the dance one, the one that they would play in the town that they're from. (laughs) as soon as you start to hear that sound build it just smash cuts to no music (laughs) i had a dig too and i discovered that um um what later on in the movie when he's like keep dancing this will be music town by next week fun fact music town was also started in the same town that occurred in footloose and that's why that is their first rule in all their stores no dancing huh that's an interesting little thing I thought it was funny, though, in this scene that AJ was so offended by Mark's music choice 
which by far this is the least offensive exactly song like mark that opens mark with picks. like a relatively accessible song and ages like Sorry, man, got to use my veto. It's like, buddy, it is the first song of your shift, and you are working like morning to night tonight. And like, Mark even warns him. He's like, he's like, oh, he was in it this early because now well, he I wonder, knows. I wonder if Mark, <laughs> like, that's why the rest of this is Mark getting more unhinged with his music choices that eventually end up with like Guar. Is Mark's like, buddy, I gave you a choice in the beginning. You turned it down and vetoed like the Gin Blossoms or something like that. Like, it's gonna get worse. But yeah, like it, this, this really reminds me of like the blockbuster days of everybody coming in and removing the standard trailer ad disc that we're supposed to play. And it's just, okay, pick any movie, just don't make it an R movie. And whoever gets in gets to pick the movie. And we're just going back and forth and choosing things throughout the day. And I think that's something that might get, it's an experience that a lot of people don't end up getting to have in a lot of their like teenage jobs. Cause we don't really have that kind of thing anymore. Like other than unless you're working at like a mom and pop record store kind of deal. That happened to me twice where I, when I was recently on a plane, I wanted to watch Oppenheimer and it was advertised by the plane that I can watch the movie. Like, Oh cool. And then I remembered that there is a vivid sex scene, like half hour, 45 minutes in, like I'm not comfortable watching this publicly on an airplane (laughs) when there's other people around. This sex scene? Wait. What? Th- what? Which what? movie? As Dean holds up his phone to the camera. <laughs> this sex scene? This specific this, one? This one, this one I'm one watching with Florence off Pugh and... Oh, Dean, you had that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of really questionable movies that you can watch on airplanes. Right. And then right. I remember explicitly at Blockbuster when, you know, that's exactly what happened and exactly what we did. I put on a movie, Top Gun, not thinking mm. anything of it. Uh, and the yeah, general that's... manager comes in, and it's during the actual love scene between Tom Cruise and and. Wait, um, I like how Oppenheimer was a sex scene, but Top Gun is a love scene. It's a different context. <laughs> they were fucking in Oppenheimer. They were making love in Top Gun. <laughs> hey, it takes my breath away. It's true. There was more emotion. There was some really suggestive silhouettes in Top Gun, and that scene. <laughs> there was. There was. And she walked in. She looked at the the video, and I'm like, Oh my god, I'm fired. And just points at Nick and makes the face like Donald Sutherland Invasion of the Body Snatchers. (laughs) And then the same thing happened with like fucking, I worked with Tim and he's like, I want to put Jaws on. Okay. It's dead. It's quiet. (laughs) And like a mom and her daughter comes in during like one of the most graphic scenes in the whole movie. And is like, yeah, uh, hi, how can we help you? I mean, that's one of the problems I think with like picking some of the older films to put on is that like ratings were real different in the 80s than they are now. Like, uh, like I... Wasn't the rule like it couldn't be, it had to be PG or something for a while? Had to be um, PG. I think it, I think it might have been PG and then we just started getting more and more lax as time went Maybe. on. Maybe. I think, I think originally it was PG and in the 80s there were still some PG movies that like had some really questionable scenes in it. Well, like Airplane, there's a topless scene in it and it's, it's a completely normal non vulgar mm-hmm. movie considering and then just that one point in the movie hysteria happens and a topless woman goes across the screen like wait well, what oh like a streaker I, why can't i remember that cuz i know they did that in what was it 1941 the other um was it zucker movie or but yeah like it's it's all of those surprises of all of a sudden movie. realizing like i've watched this a thousand times i don't remember this scene and yeah. that's when a kid's going to walk in and look at the screen and be like mom what's that <laughs> I remember that was like the best day ever at that blockbuster when they brought in like our big TV setup so we could start that was the PlayStation on it. 3 demo. That's yeah, it was. it was yeah. like the best day ever when they brought that in. It was like, what? <laughs> so we have Rex Manning playing his music video with actually uh, Maxwell Caulfield singing as Rex Manning in this. And Corey's sister arrives with a college letter for her announcing that she has made it into school. Uh, She's going to be going to Harvard, which I, they treat all of this like they're so excited for her. And then later it just seems like all of them immediately turn on Corey of like how she's leaving them behind. That it's a lot of hot and cold throughout the rest of this. Yeah. Um, The the makeup happens pretty quickly too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I was surprised. I didn't realize that Harvard was still around back in 1995. Still around going backwards. 
Or you think they closed? I mean, they only opened 95. in like 19. They they <laughs> opened in like 1993, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad that she got into this little up and coming school. Um, but Joe muscles information out of Mark on what happened with the money, and Joe tasks AJ with finding Lucas, which Lucas like. Batman evidently is like already scoping the place out because he immediately just drops from the ceiling to AJ uh, from the the roof entrance and talks to him about what he wants to do in life, which I know, Nick, you mentioned it before. This is kind of where all of that starts. Uh, Wait, somebody dropped from the ceiling? Yeah, Lucas drops from the ceiling and AJ is like, where did you come from? He's like, the roof. So that means when Lucas drove away on his motorcycle earlier, he drove away came back, climbed up to the roof, and then climbed in from the window and dropped in from the ceiling back into the store. Don't know why. He could have come in the front door. Joe's still there. Um, so this is when he starts like all of his wise advice of talking to AJ about what do you want to do in your life and how do you want to handle things, which seems kind of counter to what we've already seen from Lucas of being kind of impulsive with the money thing. And then the rest of this, he's very like the calm advice giver that everybody comes to for help. But regardless, I mean, at its heart, it's a film about kids at a crossroads of figuring out what they want to do and what's their place in the world, which I do end up liking, especially resonating with Lucas when I was young during all of this time. But Joe finds Lucas and throttles him, not the first time, not the last time, uh, and asks, what is my money doing in Atlantic City? At which point, that's when Lucas tells him, we're circulating, Joe. It- <laughs> I just, yeah, Luke, Lucas, I mean, he's a teenager. little too cavalier. And, 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 and it's so funny because like watching it now where I'm older, I watched Lucas and I cannot understand the thought process. I'm with yeah. Joe. He should be throttled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but if I was 16 watching this, I would be yeah, like. Yeah, you would side with them. I would totally side with them. I mean, maybe not specifically watching this movie, but like I could understand the thought process of like. I took this money. I'm going to save the store. Shit, it didn't work. I'm going to get out of town. You know what? I don't need to get out of town. Joe's going to be fine. He's going to fix everything. I'm going to go back. I think, yeah, because it's you're at that point, you're still probably young enough that you know it's a lot of money, but you don't see it as like, no, this is like a a major, like he will be financially destitute. Like this will be a problem. It's just, I mean, he's an adult. He probably has $16,000 in his bank account or whatever. It's like, like you don't know. Tim, you, I don't even have $16,000. $16, no. Yeah. But I mean, if you were 16 years old back in the nineties, yeah, you probably are looking like, yeah, it's an adult. Like an adult has to have money. Like, yeah. He manages don't the live store. Paycheck he's, to paycheck. he's got this. Yeah. Joe can just he, fix it. They're like high school seniors. A day. I think they understand. I don't know if they might have had a better sense of what, who had money. No. Back in the <laughs> 90s, kids had no semblance of how important money was. This was pre the uh, first major recession of our lives, so they probably didn't really have to figure out what money was just yet. It's true. It's when you could buy a house for a handful of blueberries. Yeah, people had <laughs> enough money to go to a record store and spend $9,000 on on uh, records and stuff, so... <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm scrounging to get my avocado toast and my fifteen dollars Starbucks every day. I mean, Nick, did man. you know if you just stop the Starbucks every day, like you could be a homeowner? I could be. I mean, uh, <laughs> if you take that five dollars and put it into an index fund, if you take that five dollars and take a time machine and put it into Bitcoin about <laughs> two decades ago, <laughs> but at a very specific like day. The- <laughs> The movie reminds me a lot because I always compare it to The Little Mermaid because as we're kids, you know, all everyone is like, you know, on the side of Ariel and they think, you know, she's doing going for true love. She really wants to do this. And then watching the same movie as an adult, you think that this girl's an idiot and her father who seems overbearing being as a child watching this as an adult, you realize, no, he just wants the safety of his daughter because she's going off and meeting people that he knows are that has wronged him in the past. And he just wants the best for her. So it's something similar to this where like, absolutely as a kid, you're going to side with Lucas thinking like, yeah, he's got this, he's got a plan. He's going to do something with this. And the adult me, I'm like, are you fucking serious? How's this kid not dead? The second he walked in and Joe realized what happened. Yeah. I was I was wondering where you're going with relating this to Little Mermaid. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so 
Lucas is told not to move from the couch. Uh, and then we have Gina messing with AJ by when he asked like, oh, like about Corey. And she explains like, oh, yeah, last night we spent the night with these frat guys and like we had a great time. And it just further cements the the whole thing of Corey being a very straight laced goody two shoes and Gina being the more rambunctious fun girl that's out there doing what she wants. But we continue kind of like the AJ and Corey thing continues throughout the rest of the film of them ships in the night on a lot of these things as she's trying to get with Rex Manning. But this is the Romeo and Juliet scene as the song plays and Mark creeps on a girl listening to a CD uh, and tries to kiss her. And she is kind of weirded out, but cool with it. And then we don't really know because she never is in the rest of the film. But it's the second of multiple times where music plays in the store and just everybody starts dancing, customers included, for another montage. So <laughs> we've established quite well at this point that Mark is toasted this entire film uh, because after that scene, he then goes outside and starts making out with a mural that's on the wall outside the store. <laughs> yeah, I feel like after like the first 10 minutes, it's just like, oh, now Mark is gone for the rest of the movie. He is just gone. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the thing like, that gets me is he's given clearly like a pot loaf and not even a pot brownie and he eats the whole thing like man you're gonna be fucking tripping later dude dude has a tray of pot brownies and he's just like these are good brownies it's like man you're done oh man like the physical entity of mark is present in the store for the rest of the film but what makes mark mark is no longer there right which i love the fact that like he still manages to work somehow like at what a later point in the movie he still manages to be the only responsible one he's in the, the hardest store, worker in that store including joe he's the only one working <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so kudos to Mark. Mark's keeping it together somehow. I don't know. Uh, He's going to run that store. <laughs> so uh, Deb arrives on her Vespa, played by Robin Tunney, which uh, growing up, Deb was my favorite character. Huge Robin Tunney crush for years. Joe talks to Lucas to get to the bottom of if he is okay as a person, which they kind of go back and forth on of Joe and Lucas kind of hashing things out of being angry with each other and Lucas kind of being resistant to Joe trying to father him at times, but also like genuinely Joe trying to break through to the kids of like, Hey, like I get it, but are you okay? Like, why are you doing some of the things you do? Like, is it something that I can assist with? And Joe just gets beat up emotionally throughout this entire film by all of his staff. Joe deserved <laughs> better. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's not a really good boss. Maybe he just has zero backbone. <laughs> and he's just had a really fortunate staff that hasn't abused him too much on all the liberties they're able to take. Yeah. Maybe it was Joe's idea to sell it to Music Town. He's like, please, Mitch. And Mitch is like, but you guys make $9,000 a night. And he's like, Mitch, please. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, a, he's an angel investor. And he's like, I want out, Mitch. Please <laughs> let me out. Release me, Mitch. <laughs> he owes like a life debt to Mitch's family. Um, Lucas is arguing that everybody is in trouble. It's not just him. And AJ is gluing quarters to the ground. Meanwhile, we jump to Deb cutting her own hair and shaving her head because she's going through some stuff. We never quite find out what. I think it's just genuine ennui, but we'll find out a little bit later. And AJ stops Deb because he notices her wrists are bandaged, which, as you mentioned before, Nick, like it's we'll learn later about it's a, an attempt on her own life and all of this, which she feels more is not... It wasn't an actual attempt. It was more just she had a cry for help. She just felt invisible. But we'll get more to that as time goes on, because that's kind of Deb's running through line throughout the entire film, which Lucas breaks up the AJ and Deb situation of AJ not letting Deb go until she talks to him and kind of hashes out what exactly is going on with her. And he says that AJ, she's in the store. She's going to be OK. Yeah, Lucas is kind of right. Like, it's as long as they can physically keep her in the store, they know that at least they can monitor her. So maybe we don't have to panic as much as long as she's here for her shift and showing up. I like how later on, too, you, like, Joe catches her doing her taxes. Oh, she was doing the store's taxes. That's Yeah, that's what still, I figured. I mean, it's still nice that she was actually willing to do that. <laughs> she didn't have to, so... You know how one of your employees does the company's taxes for you? 
<laughs> one of your 16 a year high school, yeah, does, high school doesn't have to file taxes themselves yet <laughs> <laughs> years before turbo tax it's pretty Speaking advanced of, stuff. i need to do mine <laughs> is march do we all 14th want to Nick? take a quick pause and do our taxes right now <laughs> i'm waiting for my return baby Oh, oh, I thought you, for a second, I thought you meant your W-2 and I was going to be like, uh, it's a little late. You should probably get on. <laughs> and dear listeners, Wednesday, April 17th is the cutoff day for taxes. Make sure you get them done. And don't go to the post office and mail anything on that day. Uh, you will be waiting yes. a long time. Yes. So Lucas asks, what's with today today? Uh, as Corey and line. Gina end up fighting with Deb, which is... They all are kind of argumentative with each other, especially Corey, Gina, and Deb together. But also Deb just generally seems to rub everybody the wrong way, other than maybe like AJ and Mark. And I like how then Gina tells Deb the shock me, shock me, shock me with the deviant behavior uh, over her shaving her head and all of this stuff that she's got going on at this moment now. But we'll get back to their animosities a bit later even though we never really truly find out what's the problem between gina and deb other than yeah they're just kind of both going through stuff yeah they never really explore <clears throat> that situation too much but like the whole cast is on a hair trigger like the tiniest little things are the little jabs and just like people spiral so fast mostly cory kids yeah that's true mostly cory at one point in my notes i have like four bullets that just is like Corey melts down about this, then Corey blows up on so-and-so. Corey melts down about this, and then Corey melts down on this person and then blows up on this other one. And it's like, wow, Corey is just through just, it just throughout a, this movie. A, a, a side effect of her, like, popping speed, like, Oh, yeah, that might be a factor. <laughs> <laughs> Meth is a hell of a drug. It's the role that got, this is the role that got her Arwen. <laughs> So the, the metal guys arrive, or all of the metalheads go crazy while Mark plays his music again after AJ vetoed the previous one. Lucas is Lost still trapped veto. on the couch, uh, and Eddie brings brownies for Lucas, which uh, we then eventually will end up seeing the results of that a bit later uh, when Mark ends up getting to them. But Joe shuts off the cover of Money that they are playing to show them the new rules for the buyout of Music Town. So he's finally gotten to the point where he decides... Here's what's happening. If this is how you all want to act, you need to get with the program that we are going to be a music town. You will end up having to follow all of the music town rules because we can't operate correctly. No visible tattoos. No revealing clothing. We're both screwed. At least you're used to it. Which I wonder, were they always not doing well? And then it ended up hitting the the deposit problem, or was it just regardless of how they were doing, Mitch was always just planning to sell them out for a music town anyway. It's, it was really hard to tell, like, yeah, because it seemed like they were doing okay, but Mitch just wanted more money, and it sounded like Music Town would facilitate that. Yeah. So ultimately, I wonder if it was like, did Lucas cause any of this, or was it just like, no, that was just another thing that happened, but. Regardless, they were going to end up being sold out no matter how well the store did. Because Joe talked about trying to buy in as a partner for which, the store. Which I'm actually pretty happy with the representation of being partner because in a lot of movies, you know, they offer like, oh, especially like law movies or like there's a lot of lawyering involved in that. And it mentions like becoming a partner. You're not just given the title of partner for like exemplary work you actually have to buy a significant portion of the company for your name to be put on the door kind of thing. So for him to be partner in this sort of situation literally would be him buying like half or a third or whatever example of like however current many investors there are an equivalent portion to be able to say that he is a part owner because that's really just what partner is. So maybe the thing was only worth like 30 grand or 20 grand and oh, 9,000 was enough to kind of get them on the plate. They, they kind of glossed over it a bit because there's like, a, like it's a quick scene where it's just like, oh, you took this money. I was going to try and buy in and be partner, but now I have to take my savings and give it to Mitch to make up for what you stole. And it's like, it's a really quick, they don't really dwell on it or come oh, back yeah. to the fact so that, that like means- Joe is like, I'm going to pay for your mistake. Yeah, so Joe was already saving the money to try to help stop the buyout, and right. this just set them back. So then he's like, well, now there's no other option. 
Yeah, so but they were going to be a music town no matter what, but Lucas did throw the wrench into Joe's plan at least. So, Lucas, sorry, buddy. Yeah, I mean Joe's plan might not have worked anyway, but like eh, it was a it was a, a concept. Yeah. So anyway, we mustn't dwell not today, not on Rex Manning Day. So Rex ends up arriving, and Mark discusses wanting to start a band called Mark with a C instead of a K, uh, which generally everybody decides is a dumb idea, but they love Mark anyway. Uh, and Lucas captures a shoplifter by just kind of lurking around and seeing that this kid is being very suspicious, where he then ends up chasing him out of the store. Gina draws the entire store's attention to the fact that shoplifter is being chased by their staff and Lucas throttles Warren. Um, at which point, uh, Joe ends up asking his age and he gives a smart response and they're like, yeah, he's a juvenile. There's so many points in this film that like something happens and they decide to just involve the entire store. I can only imagine if I'm like, in a target and all of a sudden somebody stands on like a desk and just starts like screaming like we're going to take care of a shoplifter today and we're gonna fricassee them and turn them up on like the whatever like the spit roast (laughs) and it's like okay i feel uncomfortable being a patron in this location yeah that they have there's a very specific vibe of that store and it's manic (laughs) i kind of like it though i i like the you know putting them on blast if you're gonna shoplift i think you absolutely deserve that and i think it's kind of a i would shop at that store just for the occasion to be able to catch somebody in the act kind of thing and being able to get to see that but i guess also it, it would feel like you're part of the crew if you're there and it's just like they don't treat you as like a very specific customer service service focus it's like yeah we'll help you but also like there is not the same level of filtering and we're only allowed to say the very specific like scripts for customer interactions kind of deal. It's just, if you are there, you will be treated like any other friend in the location, Um, which I guess is what probably draws all the people to Empire. Tim, I don't want to be pedantic, but I just want to check. When you say that somebody, you said he throttled him, that's like when Homer grabs Bart's throat and is like choking him to death. That's what throttling is. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Did he do that in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> no, I he hit him with a car door. <laughs> Dean, did you watch the movie? Yeah. What did you hear what I said? Well, yeah, but well, yeah. I think Dean was asking a question he already knew the answer to to make me feel like an idiot. I don't want you to make you feel like an idiot, <laughs> but every time you say he throttled somebody, I imagine he's choking him out like Homer and I'm like, is that what you mean? Wait, so is that the literal definition of throttle? Yes. Yes. Yes, Yes, it is. I just just assumed it was just to roughly grab someone. So I apologize. He doesn't (laughs) throttle Warren. He hits Warren with a car door. I want the viewers to have the right picture of of, uh, what we're describing. He assaults him with a a stationary vehicle. I feel like Joe has more throttle energy. (laughs) Yeah. Joe would be throttling anyone if, if... I do appreciate that he used the inside of the car door because I feel like the outside would have been a little bit more abrasive and oh, like was it, it the inside more versus the inside? I don't know. You always see someone getting hit from the outside of the door, never the inside. I would rather, as a car mm. owner, hit somebody with the outside of the door. My head cannon, the inside is softer. It's absolutely not, but my head cannon is. So if you hit someone with the outside, though, you might get a dent. The inside, probably less so. Yeah, but then but you're running still... full force into a door on a hinge. Mm. He's holding it. Mm. I don't know. That's a tough know. one. We could try it. He opens the door fast and it knocks Warren into traffic. So, yeah. So now Rex arrives and is concerned about his haircut and the size of the store. And Gina emerges wearing only the new Music Town apron. How does Joe take all of this? I don't know. Uh, I and... was not expecting any of that. <laughs> And Rex walks in just in time for her to say, Welcome to Music Town. My service show. <laughs> and Jane introduces Rex to the crew, and Warren continues to be a twerp. It was a well placed line. It was a. Joe's reaction was not what I expected, considering there is now a mostly nude minor. <laughs> <laughs> just. Oh, God, that's even worse. I think just I forget about that around. because all of them were. Everybody's like, 18. Older during the I, film. I, yes. Yeah. I'm going to imagine that they're. Well, also, yeah, because they're all going off to college. So I assume that they're probably all 18. 
except Bernie, well, who's probably like 40. We're, and he's we're not going to around. assume in this case. We're well, so going Corey, to know that they are 18. So Corey just got her acceptance letter, which means she's a junior in high school. No, senior. I didn't get any acceptance letters as a junior. Well, no, the junior is when you're applying. Yeah, junior is when well, you're applying. But then you don't hear back until later, right? Oh. Hmm. I don't remember that whole deal. Oh, it's true. Maybe you don't hear back till later, but you apply when you're a junior. Don't remember. Huh. She started kindergarten when she was six. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting a very deep headcanon to explain this away. Anyway. She could be a 17-year-old senior like I was. <laughs> just a side note. For some reason at this point, Dean froze on his camera like 45 minutes ago, and now David yeah. just froze as well. So only <laughs> you, Nick. <laughs> Do I only actually Nick see remains. I didn't know that. So Rex Manning now begins his meet and greet and starts talking with fans, but doesn't like the chair he's given. So it's just kind of like some minor diva behavior as far as this. Like, Rex is a jerk, but I feel like throughout the film we see some cracks here and there that it's not necessarily that he is just that much of a problem. It's just... He's kind of depressed and just trying to stay relevant to people. And it's just he's constantly upset that he doesn't have the fame or the attention that he may used to. Yeah, he's 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 a has been like he was incredibly popular and he's in the the late at the late stage downside. Yeah. And it's just like it's like it's hitting him. And he's like, you know, he's being super nitpicky because he's probably just super depressed. About the the state of his career. Well, especially with that woman that comes up starting to sing in that operatic sort of way. Mm. After that, especially like, man, you are no longer focusing on your target demographic anymore. It has changed despite how you may not want it to. uh, Yeah. So Lucas asks Mark when Mark is coming in to help get things for Rex. Mark. Yeah. Who's your favorite singer? Axel. Well, if Axl Rose was driving down the highway and saw Rex Manning stranded on the side of the road, you think Axl Rose would stop and help him? Which I get, but also it's like Rex at this point hasn't really done anything bad to the team or like any of the the staff from there. So they're just kind of being jerks just to kind of be jerks. I was going to say earlier, I had a warped perspective of the feeling about Rex just because Corey was so excited and I didn't get much of anything from anybody else. So like that they thought he was a, a hack or a washed up kind of artist. Yeah, it, it yeah. seemed like they were like they were kind of like um, it seemed like everyone was excited, but in like a, a cheesy, corny kind of way. like they all they all loved him for how cheesy they thought he was. But then they he gets there and then they just immediately turn that off and they're like, oh, he's the worst. I was like, yeah, I knew you thought he was the worst, but like you liked him like the way that myself and some other people like bad movies. Right? Like, yeah. Well, it could just be the music's catchy, but the person himself is like a shitty mm-hmm. person. <laughs> Warren ends up asking AJ, what's he doing with all the quarters? Like, why is he gluing those there? I don't feel that I need to explain my art to you, Warren. Which I like how everybody throughout the film just kind of, they're not necessarily like outright mean to Warren. It's just kind of like, you're a child to us and we're not going to just give you the attention that you want. A child and a criminal. (laughs) And he's a criminal, yes. Uh, But that's fine. Like, he'll come back with a gun. So Burko (laughs) arrives and asks about Deb um, because I guess Burko only (laughs) has two things that he does. Burko sings songs and Burko asks people, hey, have you seen Deb? I like how (laughs) Joe and Jane end up meeting this because I always shipped them throughout this film, which I do like how we end up getting back to them towards the end. But Joe and Jane end up connecting over kind of not knowing who they are anymore compared to their youth and kind of this how did I get here of there was a point in their life where they had dreams and they thought like, I'm doing so much and there's so much on the horizon. And now they realize that fast forward 20 years and it's, I didn't do any of those things, but I'm not dead yet. And I kind of hope that I can end up doing that. Um, So Joe accidentally convinces Jane to quit being an assistant and go explore her dreams. So he gets frustrated and rocks out to ACDC's If You Want Blood on drums while Mark hides Deb for Burko so she doesn't need to talk to anyone. I did like the, I did like him playing drums. Yeah. And it made me laugh in the immediate scene afterward where it's just like, why are you all sweaty? And it just immediately the, the stepbrothers line like, oh, just, <laughs> you know, watching cops. You play, you touch your drum set? No, no. <laughs> well, I do like how this shows us a little bit into Joe of like, this is the Joe that probably is connecting to all the kids of like, 
he still has that desire to just my first instinct is I'm getting frustrated. I need to do some music and I just need to like do some rock and roll or like get into some metal. And I feel like that's the thing that still shows us that the Joe that was just sitting and talking to Jane about like my dreams are dead, but I still need to like figure out who I am for the future. That's still the piece of Joe that isn't dead yet of I'm not a corporate sellout. I just, I still want to do music. I still want to do something involved with this, uh, which I guess we could all relate to. It's like, I don't need to necessarily get the dream I had as a kid, but man, just get me close enough to whatever it is of like, I don't need to be a director in Hollywood movies, but just put me somewhere on a set or like have me even working adjacently to it kind of deal. Yeah. Or or taste testing Briar's ice cream, you know. (laughs) (laughs) David, do you have a new job we don't know about? (laughs) No, no one else. Are you lactose intolerant? I am. It's not a good job. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very painful job. But no, uh, I'm trying to think. There was like a Nickelodeon commercial back in the day about like a kid who had a job and he would taste test like brownies or something. I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good job. I was like a kid brain. Like, yeah. With inflation, that kid made thirty two thousand dollars. Twenty twenty four money. This just reminds me of that stupid guy that was on the like how it's made for ice cream. And he's like a his tongue is insured to like ten million dollars and he's a meme nowadays. Oh yeah. He he's a taste tester for uh, I'm trying to remember what company. It's like Edie's. It's like it, I want to say Heinz, but that's not it. It's like yeah, Edie's or <laughs> yeah. He exclusively just <laughs> drinks ketchup. But this was nineteen ninety, so Heinz didn't even have other things going on yet. So it was just straight ketchup. Purple ketchup, <laughs> green ketchup. So, um, so yeah, so Mitch arrives at this point to discuss selling out to music town and ends up meeting Rex, which this is the point, like, so as he's talking to Rex and he's talking about like, oh, like, have they fed you X, Y, Z or like whatever, like, have they brought out platters for you? Oh, well get it now. Let me ask one of the people like, go get Rex this. And seeing Rex's reaction of just like, he turns all of it down of like, no, 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 like, it's cool. Like, I don't need any of that. Like, I'm fine. Like they're being great to me. I think that's when we actually get to see Rex's reaction of it's sure Rex is a jerk and he's kind of like childish at times, but it's like seeing him compared to an actual corporate jerk of, yeah, I may be a problem for these people, but you're still the bigger problem ultimately. And he seems almost like more relatable by comparison. Yeah, it's almost like that that scene like really toned down Rex's like bad guy vibes. Well, yeah, and then even after Mitch leaves to go into the other room, Rex just makes a face like, are you kidding me with this guy? Which, in the meantime, Joe stuffs the bank bag with papers and flyers and gives it to Mitch as a decoy, and Mitch can't tell the difference because money holds no value to him. He's never held that kind of cash before. (laughs) Like, I worked at a bank. I can tell the difference between a bag filled with actual strapped cash and a bag of just miscellaneous papers he's a he's an executive he doesn't give a shit true he probably never carries his own bank always a credit card the only thing he knows is the made the leather that things made out of because it probably matches the same leather in his shoes or something (laughs) (laughs) i had Um, these expensive money bags made out of alligator (laughs) skin Uh, so that's probably why they're hemorrhaging money. So <laughs> up on the roof, AJ prepares his speech to Corey and Burko finally catches up to Deb. So he doesn't have to keep asking. Hey, has, uh, anyone seen Deb or today? And Deb <laughs> explains how she doesn't want to be with him, which it's, this is where you were talking about before, Nick, of we don't get to hear exactly what went on, but they talk about like how he handled things last night and how Deb is frustrated with, the like how she's been in last month and last year and like all throughout her life and all of these things. So it doesn't sound like Burko is that great a partner and ha- didn't handle things super well. But I do like how we're just dropped into this to have to infer without necessarily being like, well, you know, after we started dating two months ago kind of deal. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, kind of as you said earlier, Burko does two things. He sings and he asks where's Deb. <laughs> I can't imagine that his relationship status is great. And he's probably with Deb. He's like, so Deb, where'd you go? <laughs> well, no, he can't even do that because he only can ask where Deb actively is, not where Deb was. <laughs> so <laughs> at that point, he just says to be like, hey, Deb, you want to hear a song? And then just start singing because it's only two things. It's a do loop that then leads us back to where's Deb? 
So yeah, Bur- Burko is like barely in this. Like he really is. He he's just like of the cast. He's like the most background character. Yeah, even compared to the pizza that, guy, he's really. Yeah, he's like set dressing for. Oh, I mean, maybe that's the intention. He's just kind of set dressing for Deb's character to kind of I like. Think so because honestly, I didn't even know his name. Coyote Shivers. Yeah. So Coyote Shivers was a music artist around this time. He'd been in, popped up in a couple other things. I think he was. I want to say he was like a bit part in Johnny Mnemonic or something like that. Um, but yeah. So I mean, it's the case of. We're doing a music that or a movie that's so involved in music. We cast a guy who actually like does music, who's in a band kind of deal or like has a band. Um, so he doesn't really have a lot of the heavy acting lifting. It's just kind of like, and also he's here, so this way we can have a live band perform at the end. And that guy. So finally, the police show up to take away Warren, uh, which Warren, in earshot of the police, threatens his revenge on everybody in that place. And it goes completely unmarked. <laughs> and, he and they're just like, okay, exactly what he was like a 14-year-old kid. What are they really going to be like, oh, I'm shaking in my boots. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty, but still. <laughs> Little did they know later that evening. Which we'll even get into that because that like five minutes after he gets arrested for that, he's back at the store immediately. So I don't know if they're just not locking the cruiser, but we'll see Warren (laughs) again. So Joe finds Deb doing the tax returns and offers to be an heir for her on kind of what's going on. And he ends up asking her of like, is there anything I can help with? Should I call your mom? And then she kind of has the harsh response of like, Great, you know, if if you find her, could you give me her number? Because I'd like to talk to her myself. Joe is just like constantly beat up for just trying to be nice to, and like care for all of these kids. So the only thing he can really reply to as is like, hey, you're doing a good job, Deb. And after he leaves, she says, I feel a lot better. But it, I can't tell if that's like a sarcastic, I feel a lot better or if it's no. just like, it was hard to she tell. She finally got to hear. I took it as genuine. Yeah, because it's like he's not there anymore. So it's not like I it's mean- for him. It was really tough not like I, I try to take it as serious for what it is and especially on how people can look at her character and kind of relate. I'm sorry. I rolled my eyes when she said that like, oh, you have her number because I would love to have it like, OK, all right. So this is the type of character that she's going to be. So then the follow up immediately afterward was when basically as, out of resignation, I still think you're doing a great job. Thank you for what you're doing. And then she's like, thank you. I took that at face value that yeah. she probably doesn't have someone supportive in her life to give her that attaboy that she genuinely does need. A lot of, um, you know, uh, I don't want to say authority figures, but like parental figures and um, a lot of people I know I've grown up with getting that kind of not grown up, but at least worked with, especially getting that from your boss or manager sometimes is just one of the hardest things ever. And actually to get that and hear that it completely changes your resolve. And I do feel her overall attitude through the rest of the movie improved somewhat after that one-on-one that she was able to have with him. Yeah. So I took it as, I took it as genuine. I took it that way as well. And it it was funny because like Joe, you know, she makes that remark at Joe where she just kind of like instinctually lashes out, and then she apologizes. She's like, "Oh, sorry, that's not fair." Like it was, it was like just the the quick like she still like so angry that like she just wants to lash out at, like at anyone yeah. as as quick as much as she can. It's like the instinctive response of if I hurt the people around me, they can't hurt me. Like strike first kind of deal that she's probably just grown so used to. That, like you said, when she does the, like, I feel a lot better, it's not so much just getting the, the, hey, you're doing great kind of deal from a boss. Because I feel like a lot of times in the corporate world, we get a lot of those of like the, hey, we just want to let you know, we're proud of you. And it's like, I know it means nothing because you don't know, like, you couldn't pick me out of a lineup. It's empty. It's an empty, it's a, it's an empty ceremony for them to do that versus this was more genuine. Yeah, because like she knows Joe and she knows that this isn't just like a, hey, I am the manager of this place and you're doing it. We're all family here. It's something that she can feel is genuine, which, hey, you know what? If she can't find her mother, Joe did take in Lucas. Maybe he can take in Deb. Um, I don't know if AG has family, but maybe we can have some room for him too. (laughs) So we finally get to Rex's lunch. 
Um, which Corey informs Joe that she is bringing Rex his lunch. Burko is. I'm bringing Rex his lunch! All right. Thanks, Joe. I love Liv Tyler. Very I forgot how much. <laughs> Very she's emphatically. So, great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so Joe uh, just kind of rolls with it of, fine, bring Rex his lunch if you feel that strongly about it. Uh, so Corey kicks everyone out and decides to try to finally entice Rex. And Rex tells her, like, you're a sweet girl. Like, how old are you even? And she says, like, oh, old enough, yada, yada. And he even says, like, are you sure you want to do this? That's a a bad answer. Yeah. And he's (laughs) like, are you sure you want to do this? And she's like, absolutely. And Rex, like, unzips and then shakes up a dressing bottle. And he's like, well. I hope you like the taste of blue cheese. And then she immediately gets grossed out and goes running for the room. And his immediate reaction is just kind of like, yep. And just puts his salad dressing on his salad and just goes back to eating his lunch. I don't think Rex was ever actually planning to do anything in this instance. Like for all of the problems with Rex that everybody had, I feel like this was more so just a, he already scoped her out as like, you seem like a nice kid. Like I, I'm, I'm good. But if I just turn you down, now you are going to deal with like, I feel rejected as opposed to if he's gross, it's no, I rejected him. Tim, no, it. He's a scumbag, and he's looking for slutty girls. She was throwing himself at him, but he knows just from his own past life that she's too wholesome for him. So he's not interested. It's not like a, I don't want to hurt this girl sort of thing. It's like you're not worth my time. That's a whole different thing because the second. Renee Zellweger comes in. She has the attitude that he's looking for, and it's a completely different song. And dance. I mean, I, that's a retrospective, though. I think because I feel you don't. No, I feel I, like you I don't get that until the second meeting. The way that he struck me, the second he comes in, he's extremely pompous and arrogant, and you know, like the the diva that he obviously shows us later on, and even just the fact that you know, what's her name? She quit. Jane, she yeah. didn't even yeah she didn't want to deal with him anymore like that was enough for me to know like that's you can tell what kind of a guy this person is and at least that was me reading between the lines quickly leading up to that point because i know he met in passing the entire staff and just with that mindset of that kind of person i'm sure he probably looked her up saw how she's acting with everybody else wasn't interested and immediately wrote her off Yeah, but I mean, if that's the case, if he had planned of, like, I have zero interest, the whole thing of, like, hey, like, I get it, you're a sweet girl, like, are you, like, how old are you, like, are you even sure about this kind of deal, all of that leading up, I feel like if he just had zero interest, it would just be like, I'm eating my lunch, go away. But it just, that's why it kind of felt different of, like, he's doing it intentionally of, I'm just going to gross this girl out. She's going to run out of the room. I'm going to go back to my eating my lunch and we're going to let bygones be bygones kind of deal. Mm. Well, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I mean. It's part of the test and she failed it horribly without realizing it. It wasn't him thinking of her betterment because of it. It's just like, can you answer these like four or five questions? And if she answers it correctly, (laughs) are you a robot on the the way that I'm going like (laughs) me as in Rex, how he would have responded. So mm. because it, of the way that she answered all those questions, like, you're not worth my time. I'm just going to eat my I lunch. I Turing test all of my groupies. I say it could be half and half, right? Like, I mean, Rex is clearly someone who probably had a lot of groupies, like, during the prime time is, of his career. He, he definitely comes off as the kind of person who would, like, have visitors to his dressing room after, like, after a yeah. show. Mm-hmm. And so, like, he, you know, baseline, he probably has that creepiness to him. And, and so when someone comes in, it's like, it's, this is something he's used to. And he's yeah. just like getting pleasantries out of the way because he's done this dance a hundred times. Yeah. And so like, it maybe it, it might be part like both where, where it's like, he sees her, he's like, yeah, you're a nice kid. Like, I don't, I don't need the baggage of this. <laughs> yeah. But also like, because of that is kind of sparing her from what's probably a horrible experience. Whereas yeah, I with, mean, it, it whereas, works out in her favor. Yeah, whereas with Gina, least. Gina represents herself in a way that he's probably more familiar with. Where it's like, oh, you're like any other groupie I've been yes. with. Yeah, because it's, it's me jumping on this is less about just, I don't look at him with a shred of goodness to him. 
and that he wasn't doing any of this for herself. It's just David explains it much better. And I think that's exactly that's exactly the point that I'm trying to get across that. It wasn't that he was doing this just because he saw that she's too good for this sort of thing. It's more so just he's done this like 10,000 times already. And it's just not what he's currently going for. The other girl was up his alley. Yeah, I mean, like, I definitely think that with Gina. I, I just still think that the the whole dressing thing wasn't necessarily like a test of oh if she sticks around for this we're on it's like no regardless of her reaction it was probably going to be like, like oh yeah no I'm, I'm not doing this i was just wanting to gross you out so like you run out of the room and like you don't keep trying to like follow me around or like try again later it's just like end transaction we go our separate ways like we're done um oh as far as oh yeah goes. absolutely like yeah he you could tell he had no interest and was just like, please, just go away. Uh, I mean, I guess specifically <laughs> but, talking about the undoing of the pants, I mean, I think he was on board at that point. That is a good point. The undoing of the pants, I think, was he was like, all right, yeah, well, okay, let's, if you want to do this, let's do this. I mean, maybe it was a big salad. <laughs> and he was just like, you know what? I'm in leather pants. It's been a long day. I just had lunch. I'm just going to unbuckle these things and just kind of let it out for a little bit. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so awful i don't know it's not it's not, it, it was a very creepy skeezy scene like it's i found it like kind of difficult to watch um so a uh cory found it difficult to watch too because she ran to the roof to find uh ends up finding aj who is up there kind of practicing to confess his love to her and aj tries cory melts down the first time of uh, a number of times uh, explaining that she just threw herself at Rex, so AJ runs off fuming to go kind of be with his thoughts throughout all of this. And that's when all of a sudden, like, from the roof, we smash cut to what we were talking about earlier. Like, it goes directly from Corey on the roof, upset, to Corey sitting with Gina at the pizza place, having lunch. Please, AJ, oh. please don't do this right now. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, but I, I can't handle this right now. Forget about Rex. We'll get you another guy. That it just seems out of place with this all of a sudden, like, jump. And then Corey is eating lunch with Gina, and then all of a sudden goes right into, like, slut-shaming Gina of just talking about, like, all of how she handles men and, like, of course, people like you kind of deal and all of this stuff, which kind of poor focus of anger to immediately go after your friend yeah. for all of this stuff um at the pizza place where eddie works uh ultimately i feel like Corey is not a good friend um and then we smash cut to Corey just doing some pills which we found out is speed from nick so thank you um and joe is just up playing on the roof like he's uh raphael and tmnt he's just up there like doing chin-ups and stuff <laughs> so the thing you were talking about before with gina we end up getting Gina telling Rex that she has a gift um, and that she guesses the color and style of his underwear. And there's only one way to truly find out. So they end up running off to the back room to get busy while Lucas is awkwardly left on the couch, just kind of seeing them run off together there and just sitting of the, uh, okay, I'm not allowed to leave the couch. You're now behind the other door doing whatever you plan to do um cory ends up finding aj and then decides to tell him that like sorry about before like it's just that you're my best friend which then ends up making aj kind of angry because he's like i'm trying to confess my love to you and you're just telling me how great a friend i am to you uh so he leaves in a huff and cory smashes more pills so we took a while to get to cory taking pills but once we do we are off to the races cory will be taking pills as a punctuation to every scene for the next four scenes yeah it gets kind of gets kind of intense how often that that starts coming up where it's like, yeah it's like oh now apparently mark is not the only person who is high off their ass yeah i was gonna say like mark is only taking pot <laughs> to be fair probably like a significant amount more than he should be yeah, he but probably ate a pound worth just now <laughs> i mean then again in 1995 that like mark probably had enough pot that day that they would slap him with a felony and he'd still be in prison now <laughs> you know i was watching um i watched a movie recently and there was a line in it that made me laugh and i'm thinking about it here too where um it's with uh I don't even remember any of one's names anymore. It's like this the slasher movie, but there's time travel involved. Tim, I know you've seen it. There's a lot of those. Um, there really? is uh, a more recent one. 
It's uh, like not with... It's a Wonderful Knife. It's the one that's the Back <laughs> to the Future analog. Uh, yes, that I one. know you guys are laughing, but It's a Wonderful Knife is a real movie. It stars Justin Long. <laughs> it's so funny. Girl it's wishes a funny name. Okay. So it, in, the lo- in the movie, she's like, oh, this is weed. She's smoking it. And she's like, this is absolute shit for it being in, like, the 1980s. Meanwhile, she literally has a gummy that's, like, 10,000 grams of, like, THC in it. Yeah. So I can only imagine, like, back grams. then on how bad, <laughs> <laughs> how bad, like, the pop brownie must have been back then compared to what we're able to make today. So he's, like, blitzed out of his mind. But if he had, like, a sample, it's, like, the pop brownie, it's, like, almost like inflation, right? So, like, pop brownies <laughs> now are so much more potent oh, yeah. than they were back then. So THG he adjusts was pretty for okay. cost of living. <laughs> <laughs> Could only imagine if he ate the same pop brownie today as he did back then, he would see the fucking future at that point. Well, it's, like, it's so funny. Like, I keep hearing stories about, like, people's parents who used to smoke weed back in the day. And then they go and they, like try a gummy now and they just like <laughs> are out of their minds and then all it like, takes is one, one yeah and it's gummy. like wow like marijuana is so different now than it used to be <laughs> apparently so for anybody interested the film is totally killer um yes so it's part of a long line of popular horror f- comedies recently of let's take the premise of an 80s mo- movie that everybody loves and just add a slasher to it so that's how we get totally killer freaky uh happy death day it's a wonderful it night is, so. it is basically it is basically back to the future meets scream it's a good two-hour watch go yeah. watch it anyway um yeah. so deb is making buttons to pass out to everybody at the store while also somehow insulting them through her choice of buttons <laughs> this 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 killed me because like i i understand her humor but man does it come off wrong like i these people have the patience of saints i swear because i know she's joking but like man that's if you did i feel like if you did the same thing to her she would have cut deeper i'm sorry but that's just fucking I I couldn't, man. Like I it's that's really I think all of her jokes went below the belt. Well, the only person that's like um Corey's he's baked kind of out offended. of his mind. Well, Corey's offended. <laughs> Mark is just kind of like unaware of everything. And AJ like sees it and he's just kind of like laughs it off. Because I feel like I honestly I like AJ and Deb together more than AJ and Corey because it's like mm. AJ kind of is the more artsy, more emotional person. Like that kind of works better with Deb. Um, so I always kind of liked this better. So she gives him a button that just is stupid, and he laughs, and then he turns on the Rex Manning song and just starts dancing with her. And she all the, like the first time in the movie seems to be genuinely like having a good time. Yeah, and the the ball busting's there, and you know, like if she, he understands the humor, and that's like that's the part where I'm like, because uh, I I I understand it, but it's for most people, I can absolutely see them missing her mark and not understanding that her slut shaming um, Corey with like a really rude pin, that's a joke. But yeah, and I, it's and below I- the belt. I think that's where, like, the tension comes between, like, Corey, Gina, yeah. and Deb is that, like, Corey and Gina just don't get it. Like, yeah. Well, the pin that, or the button that she gives to Corey is dishonesty, which, like, kind of hits the mark. I mean, that one's not even really a joke. It's just, like, yes, you are, like, the perfect person of this place, and you're lording it over everybody else while also having a drug problem and also like throwing yourself at rex manning and also like being mean to your own friend so it's like i feel like deb just has zero tolerance and she just doesn't do well with filtering any of it out which sometimes she probably should um which doesn't work well with Corey, but it works well with aj um, meanwhile, Rex and Gina just plow in the copy room while Mona Moore plays. Um, so De- Deb then takes AJ's shirt off in the middle of the store while customers are there. And the whole place is going wild of just like people forming couples and just dancing. So Joe is understandably confused. Like they, they're going by like the private listening booths and there's just like couples just going at it. And it's just like, <laughs> what is happening in this store? Maybe is, the, like, is Rex Manning's music like that influential? <laughs> yeah, I wonder. It's like, weren't they all just like perfectly fine until Mona Moore turned on and all of a sudden like 
Manchurian Candidate they started activating. It's like teams hearing Elvis well, for no, the first I figured, time. <laughs> well, I figured everyone in listening booths are listening to whatever they want. It's not oh, what true. the rest of the, the no, thing they, is listening to. It's a kill switch <laughs> on all other booths, and it just starts <laughs> pumping in Mona more immediately. <laughs> So, yeah, Joe is understandably confused and ends up melting down in the middle of the store that we've already established that all of the customers are there. And he starts yelling at everybody about the pending music town takeover. And like the he airs out the theft of the nine thousand dollars and starts talking about how Lucas stole that and how he doomed the store and doomed all of them and all of this still with customers there. So they really feel like a family now, which is true. It, it is true. <laughs> So, I mean, Joe, zero lies. Um, <laughs> Lucas is kind of a terrible employee and a terrible, like, f- adopted foster son kind of deal. Um, because, like, Joe's a father figure who kind of treats him well, and he still never respects him. And it's not like a, oh, like a, oh, I, you know, at the end of the day, I love you. It's like, no, he's, even when Joe is kind of really hurting, Lucas still lays into him regardless, which is kind of unfortunate. So, <laughs> Actually, I, I find it funny. In my notes, I have Joe is a father figure who treats him well. Directly, the next bullet point is Joe throws him into his office and starts working him over. <laughs> so maybe, <laughs> maybe not exactly a father figure that treats him well. He, he was until that moment. And then we're like, oh, hmm. I wonder if this is the first time. Yeah. Uh, so then Joe is looking for Rex after he walks out because he ends up telling Lucas, like Lucas even says like, I know I've like that's kind of on me. I've been kind of asking for that all day, like with everything that's been going on and kind of egging him on, which still like Joe shouldn't have lost his temper for that. Um, he probably should have just called to the cops. But I guess at the end of the day, if it's the difference between working Lucas over and then being like, OK, we're cool. I'm going to fix things versus calling the cops and having Lucas taken away for a felony and locked up kind of deal. Um, I don't know which they prefer. So. Joe is out looking for Rex. Everyone runs off to go look for them because they know where they are and they want to avoid being there when Joe eventually ends up seeing them both come out of the back room. Um, So Corey comes back to find Rex and Gina in the room and they walk out Gina first and then Rex walks out and (laughs) looks to the crowd and says, What? No applause? At which point AJ attacks him, which... Deserved. I mean... Is he the guy's a scumbag? The guy's a scumbag, and clearly, whatever the girls might have tried to do to get hit in his pants, they're still way younger than he is, and he's just doing it just to get a piece of tail. That's it. And then the guy comes out, he's already pompous leading up to that entire point in an asshole. So then now he comes out and then he says, like, what, no applause after clearly having sex with one of the girls? And then already even just the concept of knowing what was going on behind those doors was already like you can hear a needle drop because of the tension. And then him coming out and saying that, yeah, I think he deserved it. Absolutely, he deserved to I mean, get attacked for that. It's, wait, I mean, it's, AJ's also just mad because of the whole Corey thing. Exactly. Yeah. Like, that's not AJ right. deciding, like, you know what, you're pompous and, like, I'm defending the honor of all these girls. It's like, no, AJ's just upset that Corey threw herself at Rex Manning instead of accepting his confession of love. So it's like, I need to get this anger out somewhere. It's going on you, buddy. Because, like, at this point, like, as far as all of the rest... Yes, he's been pompous. Yes, he's been a jerk. But it's like, okay, so what's her name kind of came to him and he kind of turned her away and sent her off. Like he wasn't, he didn't actively come in here being like, oh yeah, like I'm going to cause a problem. It was just kind of everybody came to him. Everybody's adults. And it would be kind of weird if he walks out of a room that he was just in and all of a sudden it's just like the entire store plus the manager plus some other kid that you don't know. Like everybody's just standing there outside the door waiting for you. So yeah, I mean, Rex is still Rex is still a jerk, um, but I don't know if AJ really should have come in swinging hands on this guy immediately. I'm fine and with it. And then everybody immediately starts bashing Rex. Um, so Joe kicks Rex Thank out. You, Dean. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, what, Dean? I just said I'm fine with it. So Joe kicks Rex out and lets him know that Jane has quit and everybody starts bashing Rex uh, immediately on how much they've always hated him. And then they end up calling him an imposter, which his last lines are... Imposter. You know something? 
could all be right. And then he just leaves, which I guess in the, I don't know if the cut you guys watched, he ends up saying like, why don't you all just fade away? Um, and then he ends up leaving, but he doesn't even end with like a lot of big bluster to all of this. It's just kind of like, yeah, you might be right. Like guy, I, I could at this point be over the hill. I'm gone. And I'm just like impersonating myself at this point. So it was kind of like a weird melancholy way for Rex to leave instead of like, there, it doesn't feel like a big crescendo of like, they won the day they got rid of Rex because it just feels like, yeah, Rex kind of agrees with them of, yeah, I'm kind of a problem. I kind of understand. I'm just going to leave now. And he just walks out. Yeah. He kind of, he kind of sandbags their whole like, like righteous, like you're the worst Rex. And he's like, yeah, I am. Yeah. It's kind of like a, <laughs> I get it. Like I have to live with myself too thing. Yeah. Corey melts down on Gina. Gina blows up her speed problem on a very special episode of Empire Records. And then Corey melts down on Joe. This guy cannot catch a break. And Corey destroys the store before everybody subdues her. Customers are still in the store. So, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people have the problem with Gina talking about the, like, you're not perfect. Like, of course, you can study and do all of these things when you're munching on pills all day. And they say, like, oh, it comes out of left field. I think they do set this up throughout as far as, like, at least in the beginning of, yeah, she's somehow constantly getting all this done and she's able to do all these things and nobody can understand why. Like, it kind of was there. Um, I think as far as, like, f- actually showing us having her take pills became very apparent towards the back end that they could have, like, peppered in on the the side throughout. But I don't think yeah, it's it, anything it, that's, like, out of left field. Yeah, it was, once it was revealed, it was a little too heavy-handed. Whereas just, like, it's like, okay, like... I mean, it's true. They could have like, pepper- if they peppered it throughout, it it might have been more interesting to her character in the earlier scenes rather than being like a retrospective thing. Yeah, like it, it doesn't even necessarily need to be like how they showed it of front and center, her taking pills and like directly in a close up to the camera. It could have been like in the background, like her just at the register kind of deal, and you just see her like put something in her mouth while she's working, and it's like, okay, so this was happening throughout mm-hmm. the day it doesn't need to be the focus of the scene but we would have liked to have seen it a little bit so it doesn't feel so like and now the pills come into play for the rest of the movie so deb uh uncharacteristically asks to take care of Corey, and they kind of connect and talk things out a bit which is nice that it's like at the end of the day they do get along it just realistically all it takes is for both of them to get over themselves and just have a conversation as people um, as opposed to having a conversation with the idea of what they think the other one is. What are you? Yeah. It seems like their, their whole problem is very surface level. Like Deb doesn't like Corey for like what she represents and vice versa. Yeah. And yeah, they're, they're, they're like character types that are always at each other's throats and like can never melt together. It's like, you can see like, the high school clicks in the characters at the store. And it's just like these two areas never, never tend to mix. But then like when things got, you know, things got, I hate saying this, but when things got real, um, <laughs> they became like much more fleshed out characters and like, were actually like, Oh, you're getting to the root of the person. Yeah. Which I think, I mean, at the end of the day, that kind of encompassed most of my high school or early life. It's like at the end of the day, whatever group you end up falling into in school or like whatever you think about any of the people there it's if you really get them on one on one it's like yeah you can you probably have a lot in common for the most part of all of these different like the the metalhead kids and the art school kids and the preppy kids and so on and dean's just smiling because he was like i didn't get along with any of them <laughs> i was every single person <laughs> Dean was he was the Whitney Houston of his high school he's everyone Uh, I was a chameleon Dean was homeschooled he was all of the cliques (laughs) hey I'm picturing Dean as the talented Mr. Ridley I skateboarded I listened to corn I was co-captain of the football team and I started the musical wait seriously yeah (laughs) I'm serious (laughs) and I was good student I mean Martin you know I got A's mostly I mean, <laughs> go said I was all the, it was all the clicks. <laughs> you contain multitudes, Dean. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, so Lucas and Joe end up talking things out, which Joe talks about like growing up with his alcoholic father and how his dad told him like he'd never amount to anything and how he feels like sometimes he's right. And Lucas tries to, uh, finally, Lucas ends up like being a human with Joe and trying to tell him like, it's not too late. Like you're, you still got a lot of life left. Like don't give up on all of it. And Joe says like, you're 21, Lucas. I'm not. which kind of like the older I get, the more sometimes I feel that way. Like Joe of I shot my shot. I feel like now it's too late to, you can't start your life new in something. It's you've already kind of carved out where you're going to be from there. Um, which as we show, uh, it's not too late for Joe. So listeners, no matter how old you are, if you're 12 listening to this, you shouldn't be. And if you're 70 years old listening to this, uh, go achieve your dreams, whatever that may be, within reason. Um, I, I don't want to find like a series of murders that just has the screen refresh logo and they're like, they told me. Um, so. 76 year old man enters, M- uh, enters MMA as the world's <laughs> oldest fighter. <laughs> so, within reason, achieve your dreams, people. Uh, so Mark eats brownies while watching Guar and has a bad trip, which I always love the Hey Mark! There was a day when I was so lonely. You love Guar! Why don't you join the band? I guess this scene of him like watching himself on TV playing with the Guar, uh like playing with Guar uh in a concert. That was, I guess, a real Guar concert. They were in town and they decided like, hey, you know, it'd be cool. Like, can we grab a camera and go film Ethan like doing this over at the concert? And Guar was on board with it. So they just got to do it. And I forgot who it was that was like bringing a camera and doing it. I think like Robin Tunney was talking about it in an interview or something. How they're just like, yeah, we just got Ethan Embry in the Guar concert. And they were just cool with him coming up and doing all of that. Um, <laughs> and that's ex- what ended up in the movie. They explained it to the crowd like, we're not going to shoot a scene for a movie. Or they just brought Dean, it's a, a Guar concert. Up. I mean, you don't explain <laughs> anything at a Guar concert. Things just happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think everybody kind of came on and was just like, you know, honestly, this is this makes the most sense out of what we've seen so far. I wonder what the conversation was like from the producer to, to Guar or whoever represented <laughs> Guar. How that went. From a music standpoint, I always thought that I was pretty well-rounded enough, at least in my genre of music, that I would have heard of Guar at least once organically. I don't think I've ever heard it. I, I, I've never heard them play ever. Really? I've never heard them on radios. I've never seen them on MTV. And the only times I've ever really heard them is one from just word of mouth on how crazy their concerts are. And Beavis and Butthead has like a video game where they get Guar tickets and they're trying to just like right. either buy them again or something. And they want to go see it. But that's it. I've never heard them organically and just day to day same thing with like fish never heard their music before i don't know a single song of theirs <laughs> i think but they just they're jam. so well known i do they well with guar i'm with you like i've i've seen more of them just hear them here's them performing i couldn't tell yeah. you what the song was and then here's them yeah. on interviews like on uh, sally jesse Raphael <laughs> or something <laughs> yeah. ridiculous i mean i think um i forgot who from guar the leader from guar i think was on like holliston um the adam green show that would pop up every now and then but yeah i mean for the most part it's other than i think sodom a go-go i don't know any guar song i assume that all of them are that one song i have nothing against them they just never clicked with me but i know all of like friends growing up ones that would be like i'm going to a guar show tonight and they show up the next day with just like different colored dyes just on their body permanently and they're just like this is me now like i went to a guar <laughs> yeah. show and i was in the front row <laughs> yeah they seem wildly yeah, entertaining like, heard, but um i was gonna say I've, I've heard some of their music and like it's fine like it's it's a very almost typical kind of like hard rock um but like you go for the show yeah and like they like still kiss tour. Like, like make kiss they you know. yeah it's a lot like uh, almost like a kiss style and like they still tour. They were they were up here by me like a couple months ago. I had considered going. I can't picture Gwar in Burlington, Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> like Bernie Sanders comes out and he's like, and now next Gwar. <laughs> he's, he's leading the concert. <laughs> It'd be great, Bernie, if you were president, but too bad you gotta die. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie 
Bernie, you love Guar. Why don't you? Oh, no. So, yeah. So <laughs> Mark gets eaten. Um, and Jane returns to ask Joe if he has plans later. And yes, I continue to ship them throughout this film. Uh, Corey passes out invites to Deb's living lake. And Eddie knows a ton about music and shows how well he handles customers. I like how Eddie goes from working at the pizza place and then he just shows up. And I don't know if he's actually an employee or yeah, if he's right? just like there helping because it's like, yeah, I like the place. Of course, I just help out. He brings free pizza. So why not? I mean, yeah, any any guy that brings free pizza. He didn't carry the pizza box vertical either. And he knows a lot about music. I was getting confused him because... Earlier in the, like earlier, you were saying like, you know, Eddie, who works at the pizza place? And I was sitting here. I was like, he does? I thought he worked at the store. <laughs> <laughs> he's just, he's got two jobs. He works them simultaneously. So, yeah. Um, so Eddie is helping people out and Deb decides like she's going to go with the, the rest of it. And I think it feels like Eddie has a crush on Deb. Cause he's just kind of hanging out with her and she's like, Hey, can you do this for me? He's like, Oh, I'd do anything for you, Deb. And it's, they never touch on it. They never like have another scene together. It's just kind of that, which I would be interested to see more of all of their time together. But I feel like that might almost take away from what happens in this. Like maybe I don't want to know all of the ins and outs of all of their connections and relationships kind of deal. But Corey begins her eulogy of the fake wake as Deb lies on a bed with candles around her. Um, and Burko gives a rounding speech of, hey, stay. And then AJ's eulogy turns into him pondering art school. And meanwhile, Mark is trying to field the entire store by himself uh, while it's getting mobbed, while everybody is in the back giving eulogies that aren't eulogies. They're just them airing out their own problems and thoughts. To which Mark says, help me, help me, help me, help me. Oh God! <laughs> I feel like I could feel like I, I I felt a lot of sympathy for Mark in that moment. I I felt those moments at times in retail. Oh yeah, like we there's been so many times like where we'd be during like a rush in retail or something or like at Blockbuster on like a Friday night when things get heated, and then somebody's like, "I really need you to like the bathroom," and somebody's like, oh, "I just really need to go out and take my smoke break," and I'm like. Okay, so I'm just like the only guy right now, and we're like 15 deep right here, and there's people coming up with questions. Yeah, but that's legitimate things versus, you know, I want to have a fucking eulogy in the break room and have like four fifths of the entire staff in the small ass break room in the back of Blockbuster happening. Like, no way. <laughs> and even I would Joe is love, there. <laughs> I would love to see eight employees plus a manager plus a bed of candles in the break room at Blockbuster back in the day. I believe that would they would have to stack acid. us vertically. <laughs> the, and listen, the by the way, our break room, we didn't have a break room. And that back office was as big as a phone booth. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, the break room was literally just you open a door and it's like a shelf of the candy and other supplies. And then directly to your left is a chair with the uh, security monitors and a computer back there for doing schedules. And that was it. It's funny. I remember like you, uh, you guys had only worked at that one. I had worked in a previous one as well. And that one had an actually pretty nice break room. Uh, well, well, Tim, Tim worked it too. Yeah. I worked oh, at, you? uh, yeah, I worked at one up in, so nobody cares about this back in the day. I used to work <laughs> one in college. <laughs> a little bit about me people. Um, so I worked at one in college in, uh, like new Britain, West Hartford growing up that it was like a, you open the door and you go up a couple steps and then there's just like a general hangout area that has all of these like two-way mirror it's like a just the glass where i can see down to the store floor but nobody can see up so i would just kind of like hang out there during my lunch and whatnot and just like yep i'm just gonna hang have my soda okay. eat that's my kind of what we had at, at the first store where i was people watch it must have just been one of the store formats so, um, yes. So Corey talks about missing Gina, which then Gina just is summoned and arrives. And here's Corey talking about admiring her being herself. So they kind of reconcile from there. Lucas explains at this point, the whole thing of his mother turned him over to County at 10, three years later, Joe found him. And, uh, we kind of established that he took him in and Deb finally admits at this point, like she tried to kill herself. I tried to kill myself with a lady Beck. A pink plastic razor with daisies on it and a moisturizing strip. And shows everybody, like, what exactly she did. And she just explains, like, it, uh, at the end of the day, I was just really tired of being invisible. Which, I mean, like, 
growing up, I think we all feel that to varying degrees, that it's not even necessarily like I don't want to be a part of this anymore. It's just I would rather be gone entirely than exist as a ghost, essentially, of like people not noticing who I am. Um, like you rather feel something than nothing at all, which they kind of get over from here. So we'll see how that works out for Deb in the future. But Warren at this point returns with a gun, points it at AJ, and then we smash cut to back in the back room when we hear a gunshot, which could have turned a very dark back quarter of this movie, but AJ is fine, and Warren goes wild in the store screaming, holding a gun, still firing it, while customers are still in the store shopping. Nobody runs screaming from the store, they are still actively just checking CDs and aisles, so I don't know how Empire Records is run, that they're just all kind of cool with this of, yeah. I, I know it's revealed later that he had blanks, but nobody knew that at the time. And yet they still just react like, you can work here. <laughs> Unless all of them just knew it immediately. They're like, sounds like he's shooting blanks. <laughs> and blanks are absolutely still dangerous too. Like there's that story of like in Terminator 2 during um, the elevator shoot scene, um, the blanks that were fired caused permanent hearing loss in blanking on her name. But uh, Sarah Connor's ear. Yeah, Linda Hamilton's ear. She's She's permanently deaf from that. And that's just from shooting blanks in like a small concealed spot. He shot point blank in front of somebody's face, and basically was next to their ear. Like that would have that you're you're done. That's, yeah, those that's it. those those blanks. I I imagine still have like a full powder charge to them. Like yeah. just because there's no like slug in the casing doesn't mean <laughs> he probably had like a like quiet blanks in that one. <laughs> well, I still want to know where he got them. I mean, I doubt they sold them at the local 7-Eleven and he just hopped in there before he went over to Empire Records. It cuts but. to Warren, like, making his own bullets back at his house. I mean, it depends what state does this take place in, you know? He could have just found them. <laughs> just, 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 just. His parents knew he was going to go off, so they just preloaded the gun that they don't lock up with blanks. <laughs> I appreciate the actor's uh, trigger discipline, too. The character was deranged, but I did appreciate it on how he didn't put his finger near the trigger until he was about to fire in front of people's faces. So that was, that was nice. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So Deb advances on Warren and distracts him while everybody realizes uh, his name isn't Warren. So Warren rants until he admits that, honestly, he just wants to work here and be like everybody else. So Joe takes the gun. The police arrive again. And they decide to make him a name tag before he's caught it off, or carted off by the police, uh, which he asks, please hold on to my name tag for next time I'm back, which I guess is going to be real fast because the police say, well, I mean, it was blanks in the gun and he's a minor, so not much we can do yeah, well, because they will take do. him away and Warren will be back in two scenes. This was pre-Columbine. They could it? do a lot to him for that. <laughs> yeah like how how is this just like hey you know what kids will be kids they show up with a real gun with blanks in it firing up a store saying that like i'm back for my revenge unfortunately it's... our hands are tied there's nothing we <laughs> there's can nothing, do unfortunately there's our hands are tied do. by warren and warren has both of them <laughs> tied up it's hey, like this was this was definitely that warren call. yeah it's like don't you you can just go into stores with a gun filled with blanks and shoot at people. And there's nothing they can do about it. Well, not any store, specifically Empire Records. It was like some sort of clause of if you were shooting up this store before 1970, you're allowed to continue doing that with blanks. <laughs> it's like people get shot by police for holding a pair. Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah, like very, very lax um, in this one. So... Warren asks them to hold on to his name tag until he's back. Deb gives Lucas 1900 bucks because she says she went across the street and sold her Vespa, which then results in everybody pitching in money. Burka provides borderline nothing. Anyone seen Deborah today? And they come to $3,050 and still need 6000 more. So Lucas finally begins to break and gives up, and he tells Joe to, like, call Mitch, turn him in. Like, he gets it. And Mark has an idea and runs outside to the newscast reporting on Warren, takes over the microphone and announces there's going to be a party at Empire Records. We're having a get-together here tonight. There's going to be free admission, live music, no, no, no. hits, <laughs> chicks, the today. full nine yards, man. It's going to be heavy <laughs> shit here at midnight. We're live on the air right now, sir. Uh, that's what the story, kid. Anybody can come. 
Some shattered <laughs> Hear him in night, party on, on men! More updates Damn as the man! Save Patrick the Empire! And they explain, like, Burko's band is going to play it. They'll sell beer on the streets. Joe asks, what about the alcohol permits? They say, forget the permits. That's not going to be a problem later. Then again, the police couldn't even take Warren in after showing up for theft. He shows back up, shows up with a gun, comes back again. So maybe the police are like ineffectual. In Man, this. Wesley. And Brad, he's underage drinking and just like four scenes later. Brad Wesley yeah. could easily come in and take over this town, it seems like. <laughs> for all we know, Music City was Brad Wesley. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love I love the concept that like we need like six thousand more dollars, so we're gonna throw a party. It's like Lucas, if you would get six grand throwing a party, do that. Why did you need to go to Atlantic City and bet all of this money? <laughs> you do that at least once a month, and your your profits yeah, right? will be will be in a good Lucas, spot. if you can make six thousand dollars in one night throwing a party. Then why is Burko living in a trailer outside of Empire Records? I wanted to bring that up because, like, does he live in a container, like, outside of the record shop? Just by Maybe the river? Maybe if he doesn't live there, that's where they contain Burko. <laughs> <laughs> does anyone know where Deb is? Get Burko. Attention, stage one. Laser cutting begins. Laser cutting complete. Hey, has uh, anyone seen Deb or today? they just like they have to put the bag over his head and then he just goes to sleep and then they take it back off and instantly he's just like does anybody know where deb is do you want to hear a song and they're like okay burko come on let's do this <laughs> so yeah so aj sells his art we see him selling that out there burko's band ends up playing a top it feels very much like when audio slave played in manhattan back i forgot how many years ago of like just every all the crowd out there and they're just like up on top of the building playing but Mitch arrives. He realizes he's been duped at this point. Lucas argues that when Music Town comes in, everybody's out. They're going to bring the customer base away and they're going to be left with nothing. So Joe vows to open up his own store and then just quits, which that's when we get Sugar High, which is the the number one song known for by Coyote Shivers, except we get the version where Renee Zellweger sings, which is unfortunately is not on the soundtrack, which was always a bummer that it's like, if you want to listen to the version from the movie... You just got to listen to the movie because there's not the track that's actually on the album. I didn't know that was actually her. I thought it was E.G. Daly that was singing because there was like a couple of notes that her voice sounded like E.G. Daly that she does the voiceover work for certain things. And when I looked at the final credits and online, it was actually her singing, which I thought was nice. Yeah, which I didn't realize she was doing it this early. Like I know that she did all of her singing like for things like Chicago and musicals and things like that, but... I didn't realize that as early as this, it was just, yeah, it's something that she does. So yeah, so I like that version, but unfortunately, like it's it's not anything that they have on the album. Um, but everybody from everywhere arrives. We have the burnouts, the hippies, the grunge kids, the metalheads. Everybody is out here to save the empire, uh, which Mitch can't handle all of the people in the store and asks, does anybody work here? Which must just summon Warren because somehow he evaded capture by the police <laughs> again. And he is now just present. Well, they, they couldn't do anything. The cops can't do hold it. him. Can't hold him. This kid is Teflon. So ridiculous. So, ridiculous. <laughs> uh, so Mitch just gives up and sells the store to Joe rather than having to continue dealing with all of it. And like, I know that Mitch is this very basic, bare bones, like corporate face as the well, evil no, guy. Well, no, no, no. Just before that, everyone basically told him point blank, I quit. So he had no one to support the store even going up to that. And that's where he was up to his neck and trying to continue sales during the party. Yeah. And that's when he was just like, you know what? I don't fucking care. Just take it. I'll sell it to you dirt cheap. So, like, I I know that he's just a very basic corporate villain kind of deal but it's still nice just to see all of these plucky kids having their dreams and this older guy who's just trying to take care of them winning the day um and beating big corporate america and then we get aj and Corey reconciling on the roof he decides he's going to go to art school in boston to be near Corey and harvard the roof finally turns on we get the gin blossoms kicking in and then we get the end credits to This Is The Day by The The, one of the hardest bands to search on Kaza or LimeWire back in the day. Um, and everybody just dances as we get the credits to Empire Records. Everybody clap, claps. <laughs> everybody give a little clap. Um, 
so yeah, so that's it. So I, I loved the movie. I still love the movie. I will always love the movie. Um, despite all of its, any of its faults. I don't know for any first time viewers, if you guys feel the same way, any second time viewers, I would not be surprised if you say, you know, there's a lot of things that are kind of weird about this. I think there are things that are I don't weird so. about it, but um, that's what makes it memorable. I, I, for me, it's like, I, I see why critics would like this, but I also see why this hit with you at your yeah. age. Yeah, In the same way, 100%. I kind of said this at the beginning of the episode, in the kind of way that Hackers did. It, it seemed like it's it's hitting... Hackers has a different tone, but I think it's speaking to the same crowd, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um. So this... I'll say this didn't really land with me as a whole. Um. I did find parts of it enjoyable. But um. as a, as a current day screening, screening it like... I would say it wasn't for me. But I don't begrudge you from liking it because I can see why. I I know I like lots of movies that probably, upon viewing today, if somebody watched them, you know, they're not. It doesn't hit them because of there's a nostalgic factor here that I understand. Drop oh, that, so you're not going to drag it like Tim drags dro- drop that Fred. But I but I don't know because that movie is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I kid, I bust balls. No, I feel the same way. Like I don't, I don't like outright hate it, but it's not like it's just it wasn't a formative movie for me. And I absolutely see the draw on, you know, if I were that young to have watched it, absolutely I would have been all over it. You know, I watched Hackers when I was younger. You know, I know. I mean, my movie, my formative movie was the fucking the the Brandon Lee Crow movie, and I know that's a tough watch to do as an adult now. But back then, like I, I was drawn to it, and I fully get and respect it. I was so close, honestly. I didn't know if you guys had sat down to watch Empire Records, and I was going to pull an audible and be like, if you guys don't want to do this movie, like I'll pick The Crow, and I'm glad we ended up doing this one. But we will get to The Crow eventually. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm in the same boat. I, I was not introduced to this movie during the time where I know I would have been a hundred percent down like this movie really speaks to the like angsty teen or like i mean it really speaks to like any teen like going through that those like transition phase of their life when you're trying to figure things out it didn't land for me um but i totally get and like understand like why this would be like a cult hit and like how it speaks to certain generations yeah, just it just didn't didn't super land for me. I don't know. I mean, some of the things for me, I don't think aged super well. Was it Warren? <laughs> <laughs> Warren's definitely a weird part of the movie. <laughs> no, I mean, there's just there 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 were certain things about it that felt kind of. I mean, I don't I don't want to I don't want to drag or drag the movie or yuck anyone's yum. It just it just certain things felt a little dated and a little old fashioned, uh, and how they handled and talked about things. Which just didn't just didn't work for me, but I, I did enjoy how the band like credited the band in Mark's dream, Guar. I, <laughs> I that got a laugh out of me as I was watching the credits because there's a little like at, like oh yeah that's I right, say the after phone credits because it wasn't like that, but it was just Mark and the uh, the pizza guy just talking about I don't even remember what it was, but they were going back and forth about just Primus the and the Pixies. Too. They were like essentially like one up, not one upping each other, but. They're kind of tearing down yeah. each other's musical taste. Um, I feel like it was either the writer or the director just being like, I want to get some, I want to personal, yeah, views personal out views out there on some of these bands. Yeah. So uh, for anybody out there that either loves this movie, hates this movie, or has <laughs> never seen this movie, and you want to reach out to us and talk about it, uh, as always, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, at Screen Refresh, or email us your own movie memories at ScreenRefresh at gmail.com. If you like the show, help us out and leave a rating or review on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast to help others find us. If you like horror, check out our other show on the Screen Refresh Network called Don't Open This Podcast with me and Mike Falsigno with new episodes every second and fourth Monday of the month and tune back in for Rule of Thirds every third Monday of the month. So for Nick and David and Dean, this is Tim wishing you a happy Rex Manning Day. That's it. The end.